I'm first of all, I'm honored to give this keynote speech here during the Tourism Naturalist Symposium. Thank you very much for inviting us. And also, of course, thank you very much for joining um, this, this keynote now for the audience. Thank you. Um, maybe let me introduce myself real briefly. My name is Claudia Mitchell and I work for Bavaria Tourism, the state marketing organization for the tourism to Bavaria. And um, I've been working for the company for over 16 years, so I've been here very, very long. And uh, I love to work for Bavaria Tourism because as a travel destination, Bavaria is really beautiful. Um, today, I would like to introduce a little bit of our company to you, also how we do our brand marketing and our view on sustainability for a destination, because we believe that you have to differentiate if it's a destination or if it's like a hotel or a sightseeing attraction. And last, I want to give a very short insight into a few digital projects we are doing, but then in the parallel in another session, we also have my colleague Markus, who's talking on that topic more in detail. Um, I want to start the presentation with a little film on Bavaria. I hope you can start it. So I would tell you when to continue the presentation. So if you could go to the next slide, please, and then start the movie. Um, oh, uh, okay, good. No, sorry, you don't have the movie. I have the movie on a on my version here, I included it this morning. It doesn't matter. So no movie, whoever wants to see a movie, get in touch with us or watch our YouTube channel, the English version. We have plenty wonderful short movies on um, Bavaria. So let me continue about our role and some numbers just to, to get us into the, the picture. Um, we are Bavaria Tourism Marketing and Management um, GmbH. And we actually changed our name from Bavaria Tourism Marketing to Bavaria Tourism Marketing and Management because we realized years ago that we are in a change progress process also from um, us as a, as a tourism company. Our, our roles change. So you can see here we have three main roles that we identified for ourselves. We do marketing and we try to um, to really be the trendsetter on marketing and um, to be to always feel what's new in the market. And um, so a few years ago, we really decided our job is to inspire people to come to um, Bavaria. And uh, how we do that, I want to talk about a little in a little bit. Our second big role is that of networking and that grew tremendously during the pandemic as well, because all of a sudden partners from all over Bavaria from the tourism industry got in touch with us and wanted our support, our help, our advice. And um, all of a sudden we had, we had the, the, um, the job also to be this, this voice to the tourism industry. And we also created some like e-learning platforms in that time so that we could keep our partners together. Um, we developed networks, new networks in the tourism industry where we gave our partners a platform to exchange ideas and thoughts. And that section of our company role really grew tremendously in the pandemic time. And the last pillar is this so-called advocacy or maybe lobbying work. We of course are the voice of uh, the Bavarian tourism into politics, into PR, um, to, to associations where we are members with, and we wanna make sure, of course, that we um, show Bavaria in the best manner. Um, there's one speciality about our company, I think that differentiates us a lot to other state tourism destination marketing companies, which is that we founded a an own unit, which we call Kompetenzstelle Digitalisierung, Competence Center Digitalization, which my colleague Markus Danitz runs. It's an own office that we opened in Waldkirchen, which is actually fairly close to the European campus. And we will have up to 10 people working there. And this shows how important that whole digital um, topic is for us and that we want to help um, develop digital project and also help our partners with the digital transformation. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah, that's here. You can see um, how, how important it is, it is to us. I've already talked. You can go one further, please. Next slide, please. 
I want to give you a very, very brief overview of our numbers and tourism development. Of course, there's a time before the pandemic and now during and within the pandemic. Um, and we all know that everybody suffered tremendously, every country worldwide, of course. Before the, the pandemic, Bavaria was really on a strong, strong growth track. Over 10 consecutive years, we had growing numbers in our overnights and arrivals. And those are more or less the numbers that we in Germany are measured for to see how successful our tourism um, industry is doing. And um, so we were really doing great. We had over 100 million overnights in 2019, which was a big milestone for us. And before the pandemic, we had a share of 20% or over 20% of international visitors to Bavaria. And um, we have always been for a long time the number one tourism destination within Germany. When the pandemic hit, of course, as everybody all over the world, we were hit hard. We were down over 40% in overnights and over 50% in arrivals. We still managed to maintain our position number one um, as tourist destination within Germany and generated also in the pandemic almost 20% of the whole share. Um, the next slide, please. Here you can see a little bit visualized how the trend was going up. And then the last pillars, of course, are the um, numbers of the pandemic. But I can, we can put our hands up a little bit. 2021 looks much better. I mean, it's still bad. And of course, we are comparing the numbers from 2021 to 2020, also pandemic year. But in August 2021, so this August, we had for the very first time ever over 10 million overnights in Bavaria, which was the strongest month ever measured in tourism in, in Bavaria. So that shows that, of course, we are not catching up to the situation of before the pandemic, but um, destinations that have good capacities and a, a good offer for the tourists can really um, make up some of their losses. And also what's really pleasing us is that the average stay of our tourists increased to 3.3 days, which um, for us, of course, is great because that was one of the only benefits we thought we could see in the pandemic that more Germans would spend their main holiday in Germany, in Bavaria. And um, with this behavior, of course, um, increasing the average time of stay. Um, I want to share one more information. The day trips are very important from an economical point of view. Unfortunately, they are not so much in the mindset of the people, of the local people, but also not from the politicians. As I said earlier, we in Germany are really measured by overnights and arrivals, but the day trippers, think they make a lot of money. And in, the, in a normal year, in 2019, before the pandemic, they had a share of 46% of the overall gross turnover of all our tourism, which is almost 50%. And it's a huge impact that the day trippers are having. Um, and in Corona, and, and let's say in the live lockdown areas, those day trippers, of course, were the only guests that were coming, or maybe those from... from um, the very close kind of neighborhoods and, and destinations. So um, I think that the view on day trippers and on, on day trips will change and it has changed. Um, and unfortunately it hasn't only been um, looked at in a positive way. I don't know if you in your countries had similar um, situations, but we experienced that, especially from the urbanized destinations in the lockdowns and in the, let's say, air, the times of light openings. Of course, the people from the cities and from the urban places, they wanted to go on the countryside because they had not seen the countryside for a long time and they needed it for their, also for their well-being. So a lot of these day trippers um, jumped in their cars on the weekends and drove in the countryside and um, had a heavy impact on the destinations there, on the locals, on the nature, and not everybody was happy about the day trippers. And the worst of all was, of course, that during the lockdown, they couldn't spend any money. So normally when people spend money, then maybe the locals are 
okay or happy, but if, if they're coming, leaving maybe their trash behind, um, all the parking um, was full and on top they couldn't spend any money, then there was a little bit of a dissatisfaction in the local communities. But I want to talk about that in a little bit on a different topic as well. Let me now go to brand marketing, which is the next slide. Um, maybe I give you, you, you can go, go one further. Yeah, thank you. We say that Bavaria tourism acts as a marketer for the Bavarian attitude to life at home, in Germany and abroad. And um, I want to share a little bit of an insight of our marketing, the way we do marketing and how it changed over the last years. Um, and it did really change over the last years. I've been working in this company for many years, so I've seen different um, different strategies in marketing our travel destination Bavaria. And a few years ago, I think the biggest decision we took and that had a heavy impact on our marketing was that within the customer journey, which, which most of you probably know, where somebody thinks about a product, then researches the product, buys the product, experiences it, and then maybe afterwards talks about it. In this customer journey, we decided that we as a state organization have to be in the inspirational phase of the customer journey on the very, very beginning. And you might know um, that in, on average, every person um, has more or less six to seven travel destinations in mind where they want to go next. And we said as Bavaria Tourism, a state tourism company, we have to make sure that Bavaria is one of those travel destinations in the mindset of our potential guests. And how do we, how do we want to achieve that? Of course, with very professional, timely and inspiring marketing and with addressing the right target groups. And we really defined that all our focus of our marketing work will be in this inspirational phase of the customer journey. We then went ahead and defined our core marketing messages and also founded a marketing claim, which is Bavaria traditionally different. We say authenticity, emotions, culinary aspects, home, the feeling of homeland, but also future quality, competence, originality, those are really important factors that play a role in our umbrella brand Bavaria. And we said to bring it all together, the real traditional part, the, the, the heritage part of Bavaria, but also the look into the future, we say our marketing claim will be Bavaria traditionally different. And that's the claim that we use above everything for our marketing. And we want to show with this claim how comprehensive and diverse Bavaria is as a travel, travel destination. And of course, we know it and we are very grateful for that. We are very lucky what we all have in Bavaria. We have beautiful countryside. We have a lot of things that people worldwide associate with Bavaria or with Germany. We have the, a very strong reputation, be it beer, be it Oktoberfest, be it the Lederhosen, Zugspitzmann or Neuschwanstein Castle, those are all located or happening in Bavaria. So we are very, very lucky. But we have a lot of these wonderful traditions and li lively customs and crafts, which are often represented by young people, by young spirit people who also represent Bavaria and for us are the future picture of Bavaria. And we want to transfer this picture into the world more or less with our, with our marketing that we think we, we picked the right way. So once we decided we want to um, go in this inspirational phase and with this claim of very traditionally different, of course, we had to think about how do we want to do this. And we said, we need to reach people. We need to touch the people. And how can you touch them best? We thought with word and with pictures, with images. So we invested a lot in our um, picture um, language and um, we made a lot of um, content um, on, on images that really yeah, represent this claim Bavaria traditionally different. Um, our next step, and we can go to the next slide, please. Our next step was to define 
how do we want to tell stories? And we decided we want to build up so-called Bavarian ambassadors or Bavarian insiders. And those are over 80 personalities all over Bavaria, really in, in big cities, small cities, on the countryside. Um, and they are all representing different kind of aspects of Bavaria, of our culture, of our traditions. And with these ambassadors, we are showing Bavaria through their eyes. Um, they are telling their personal stories. They are telling their, um, their passion about Bavaria, their philosoph philosophy about Bavaria. And um, with these personalities, we can more or less cover the whole country because they represent every corner of Bavaria in every different aspect you can only imagine. And um, we really took a lot of time, effort and money to build up a whole set of um, marketing material around these ambassadors. We went to them, we did photo shootings in summer and in winter, we produced video um, material. We um, made interviews with them, with, um, like advertorials. We we um, used the material we we um, got through our social media channels, of course. For we make we use it on our website. We have a brand new website, um, which is of course full with the content of the um, Bavarian ambassadors. And with these ambassadors, we can tell stories all over the world and attract people and be inspired to come to Bavaria. And the, the nice um, second side factor of it is that, of course, now all of a sudden, some towns get maybe attention that hadn't been in the focus of a tourism um, marketing campaign before. All of a sudden they get attention because they have um, ambassadors in their town. And all of a sudden the local people also realize how beautiful these ambassadors are and how beautiful their stories are and they feel proud. And this is a really nice side effect that we gained from um, this whole strategy with these ambassadors. Um, let me see. Yeah, I wanted to say a few more words on um, our thinking behind um, the ambassadors also. I don't know if anybody has heard of that um, trend resonance tourism. In German, we call it Resonanz Tourismus. Um, there was a study long before, already before the pandemic of the of a, like future institute agency who detected that trend, the global, I like guess the global trend of mega, uh, of, um, sorry, of resonance tourism. Um, and the study says that the future tourists, not all of them, you will always have the, the um, mass market tourists that maybe want to spend on only very little money, go on a two week beach holiday and are happy. Um, we're talking of the more, let's say, um, sophisticated, interested tourists. They want to dive in into the local culture. This is not really something new that has been um, like of interest a long time, but the, the resonance tourism study says that the people want to really have touching moments with the local people in the destination where they travel to. They want to not be seen as tourists, but like as part-time locals, let's say it a little bit. And um, they want to make real encounters. They want to be touched and they want to make deep experiences, which they take home then. And then with their memory about their hopefully positive experiences, they bring a little bit of that holiday home in their normal lifetime. And we believe that, very strongly believe that in Bavaria, with our ambassadors as like samples of Bavarians, we can communicate that longing for resonance very well. And when the people come to Bavaria on their vacations, on their holidays, they very often really have these deep encounters, let's say in a beer garden where you sit together at a table with some locals or you, you walk in a, in a town and then you see people coming from, from a wedding all dressed in their local um, costumes in their Trachten. And we believe that the ambassadors and our whole idea of tourism to Bavaria fulfills this longing and inspires for holidays to Bavaria. So this is called resonance tourism and that's part it's a big part, an important part of our marketing and how we try to 
um, appeal to people. And it also has something to do with sustainability. And that brings me to the next big topic. So that was the topic of brand marketing. And now we continue to sustainability with the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to share a little bit our perspective on sustainability, because we believe as a destination, you have very different um, challenges than, than like a hotel or um, a leisure park or, or other um, supplies of tourism services. We think as a destination, you have to really see it in a wider picture. And that's why we um, follow the UNWTO idea of sustainability, which you have, see, have here, tourism that takes full account of its current and future economic, social and environmental impacts addressing the needs of visitors, the industry, the environment, and the host communities, which are the locals, right? Um, so we follow the view of sustainability as a triad of three identically important sectors, which is, shows the next slide. And they all correlate with each other. Oh, I, sorry, it's, I took that slide out. Um, it's the slide where economy, ecology, and social or cultural all comes together. Um, no, I'm fine. I just, sorry, you can go back, please, to the one uh, where it says the pandemic. One further back, please. One further back. Yeah, stop here. Thank you. Sorry, I can't uh, operate my presentation. Um, so we believe that economy, ecology, and the social and cultural sector, they all have to, uh, they're all interwoven, they all depend um, on each other. And, and we want to see it as a whole, as a holistic system where they all interfere with each other. And only if all are in balance and all are um, treated equally, then we can talk as um, sustainability for a destination because you cannot just see the nature um, which several people seem to focus on most now especially in the pandemic it really became a buzzword the whole econ the whole sustainability but often only um, reduced to the the environmental um, part of it so we believe sustainable thinking needs everything and I mentioned earlier that example of the day trippers during the pandemic, and that showed very, very clearly that in um, the pandemic, the balance between economic and e economy and ecology wasn't in balance, and the people were, the, the local people were dissatisfied because they had super busy towns, but no money was left there. So the economic, the economical situation is very important, and we also believe that during economical uncertainties like within within the pandemic um, people or companies or entrepreneurs will not really think of investing in sustainability they need to make sure that they can survive that their business will be still there next year so they focus on on other things than sustainability so for us the economical part is very important now i come to the next slide of course the countryside the nature the environment, that's the basis for our tourism in Bavaria. That's why people come to, to visit us because they love our countryside. And of course, we have to do everything to make sure that we maintain a healthy and beautiful environment. Um, but as I said before, we do not only focus on the environmental part of it. And um, I want to share one insight that we have from some research studies in Germany, talking about German um, consumers and uh, there was a study done which asked people about sustainability and holidays and it showed very clearly that the consumers are very well aware of sustainability and they also want to contribute and want to be more sustainable in their own lives but at the other side when they were asked if they would pay more money for it at the moment, they were still not so open to it. So paying more for a more sustainable accommodation or tourist attraction, or maybe leaving the car behind and taking public transport instead, that people were not so open-minded to it. So we believe this might change and hopefully will change at some point. Um, 
but we won't focus on like making sure that Bavaria has tons of sustainable offers available in the next weeks. We say we need to make sure that we as a tourist destination position ourselves in our entirety as a sustainable state, as a tourist destination. And we believe that that will be very, very important quality factor, how people in the future will choose their destinations. And then, of course, we asked ourselves, how can we do that? And how can we prepare for the future? And uh, as you know, we work on, on two sides, more or less. We work on the consumer side, where we do our marketing. So we have to include that topic in our um, marketing. But we, of course, also work as a service partner for our Bavarian um, tourism industry, the B2B industry. And um, so we, we see a few big topics on our agenda for the next time, which is A, raising awareness for the gift we have here and helping our tourism partners and their local communities to understand the positive impact of tourism. Because discussions over over tourism and, and these buzzwords don't really help that the local people increase their awareness of how much good tourism does for them not only the income by the tourism but also um, maintaining hiking and biking infrastructure more regular bus lines if you're on a remote countryside town there's so many other positive aspects that come along with tourism development which um, we believe we also have to communicate more so that the local people understand the value of tourism and um, also, we believe that we have to take seriously the concerns of people when they get, for example, these over tourism developments and destinations where, where people are, are worried about their hometowns. And we have to um, try to um, help them. And, and we, we came up with a, um, with a campaign where we wanted to a, educate the consumers, the, the tourists, but also um, help starting to be more communicative with the tourism, um, with the politics, for example, to tell them that it's important to raise awareness for the importance of tourism in their communities. Um, the next slide is on, um, on how important the local people are in the whole triad of sustainability. The local people with their local um, and cultural and also social aspects and uh, we say if only if the locals are happy with their hometowns with their heimat with their communities um, they can be good hosts of course and so in the end um, the local people with that local trachten the regional cultures um, their old recipes we want to maintain those and bring them in the future and we believe that with our storytelling idea of that ambassadors, the Bavarian ambassadors talk about their crafts, about their, their work, their, their, their hobbies that they maintain. We also um, support that whole system of sustainability by helping putting the social cultural aspect um, in the center of our communication strategy. And, uh, so all these together, economy, ecology, and the social cultural aspect, those three together, we believe we have a very good basis for a sustainable um, tourism development in our destination and believe that this will be um, our yeah, work of the future to help our tourism industry to understand and to all go the same way. Um, now I go to the next topic. I want to make a very quick step into digitalization. Um, I don't want to talk too much because my colleague Markus is also in this program and talks more about um, visitor guidance and, and the, the um, iCloud tourism, the, the tourism cloud. I just wanted to point out again that um, by opening up that competence center in Waldkirchen, we really um, commit ourselves to the digital transformation. And of course, the digital transformation is everywhere. It's in, in the marketing, but it's also, of course, in 
um, aspects like um, visitor guidance. And that's one of the topics that we have, um, or projects that we have taken over in the Corona time, we call it the so-called Ausflugs ticker. It's like a web-based um, app to see immediate occupancy rates of destinations. For example, parking spots are full. Um, we want to include the traffic information because if I live in Munich, every weekend people just go out in their cars in the countryside and you are like 20 kilometers behind the city borders of Munich and you're in the first traffic jam. And where you normally maybe travel to, to a destination an hour, all of a sudden you're stuck in traffic and it takes you two hours. And um, so our idea is to, to bring all these data together in the Ausflugs ticker um, and include maybe also weather forecasts, as I said, traffic um, information to then give the people who are planning their day trip or also visitors who are playing their day trip from the location where they are staying, um, that they look in that Ausflugs sticker in the morning and see, oh, where I'm planning to go to, it looks pretty busy. And then we have all kinds of alternative ideas for them. And with the alternative ideas, of course, we can steer tourism a little bit. Of course, this project is still in the very, very beginning and um, we're still working on these interfaces and, and digitalization of parking spaces, for example. So this is all in the very early stage, but we hope that with every service that is digitalized and then included in um, our Ausflugs ticker, we give more service to the people, to the potential guests, and of course also help the locals that maybe their destinations are not so overcrowded on the weekend because people have an alternative place to go to. Um, the next slide, please. Um, Make maybe, maybe one more minute, Claudia, and yeah. uh, let us... Super, I'm, I'm almost at the end, thank you. So this is a very um, nice campaign that we also developed. We, we also learned that a lot of people went in the countryside and didn't really pay a lot of respect to the nature and not to the local either. So we created that website, which we call Discover Bavaria considerately in German only, where we want to motivate the tourists um, to behave responsible and respectful but we did that website in an entertaining way and not with like a pointing finger. You have, don't have to do that. And we used a very well-known Bavarian comedian as a testimonial, but also some like rangers, people from the, um, the forest uh, association. And yeah, with this website, we really made sure that we um, talked to several people. Um, the last slide, am I still there? Yeah, the last slide is on the iCloud. That's our last project, uh, our biggest project at the moment. We are, um, our idea is to collect data and make it accessible so that it's a service for the tourism industry and the consumer alike. And we are planning to launch it in 2022 and it's uh, planned to be in German and in English. And my colleague Markus will talk about more in his workshop. And um, in the end, I could stop here if my time is up. I have four more slides, which is just like a final thought, which I could quickly read to you, or we skip them, you decide. It can take one minute. Yeah, let's probably just a few seconds or up to one minute, and then we'll proceed to-, to Okay, then the, let's just quickly go through these slides and I just read, it's like final thoughts from us. We say Corona is a metal, massive catalyst for digital development, and at the same time, reinforced the desire for interpersonal relationships. The next one. Digitalization is important and makes us better and more efficient in tourism. Next one. Our Bavarian attitude to life is the answer to the search for resonance during holidays. And the last one. Destination development has to take locals and visitors into account alike and create a we experience. And that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Claudio, for this uh, exciting presentation. Of course, yes. I do hope that everybody in this audience uh, has already had a chance to visit Bavaria at least once. <laughs> and if not, then I it hope is, so too. Yes, then it is absolutely, of course, absolutely recommended. And not only because we are based in Bavaria as well, uh, our school, uh, Degendorf Institute of Technology, 
but everybody knows that Bavaria provides some of the most, uh, you know, rewarding tourism experience because of the nature, of course, because of the culture, the history and all the rest. So we should all look forward to next opportunity for the Degendorf Institute of Technology to host uh, a conference uh, in relation to tourism and uh, hope for, uh, our, for, for the possibility to invite everybody in person to visit us. Now we have uh, one uh, question uh, in the audience. In the meantime, uh, we could also take one, two more questions. So please feel free to raise your hands should you have any question. And let me, um, uh, let me read the question from uh, uh, Sebastian Markov, dear Claudia. Mm -hmm. Also in Austria, August 2021 was, despite or because Corona, the best mm -hmm. tourist month ever. Again, do you think this will be a long lasting shift? Can Bavaria and Austria keep this high level of arrivals, overnights and revenues, or will this decrease to pre-pandemic levels soon? A very interesting question, please, mm -hmm. Claudia. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I need to do one thing really quickly because I'm on my phone, my battery is down. Um, give me one second. I listened to the, I heard the question. So I, we do believe that it will have a long-term impact. Um, however, we are also seeing already how people are longing for um, more, yeah, to go on, on trips where they can travel on plane to destinations abroad. So we believe that it's our challenge now to make sure that people really, um, yeah, keep us in the mindset. As I said in the speech, six to seven destinations has everybody in their mind where they want to go to. And we have to work really, really hard that people stay in our mindset. And then when they come to us or repeat coming to us, we believe that with the product we have here, with these personal touching encounters with local people, we will really make some more repeat clients and uh, happy customers. I don't know if that answered the question. Thank you very much. Um, assumingly, we have no other questions from the audience. I do not see anything posted in the chat or uh, raised hands. So thank you very much, uh, Claudia. However, hopefully we, we, you, you shall uh, remain with us in this room. And uh, should we get anything uh, later uh, through mm -hmm. chat, uh, we can probably give you another chance to um, uh, to talk to us. But now, what I would like to do now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Professor Baumgartner, who unfortunately was uh, not able to join us earlier because of some technical issues. But I, it is my wish to uh, provide us all with an opportunity to um, uh, hear from uh, Professor Baumgartner. And I would ask my technical um, colleagues, our, our staff, our, our backup staff to um, start sharing the presentation of Professor Baumgartner. And uh, Professor Baumgartner, we are happy to give you uh, the floor now. Unfortunately, we will have to significantly shorten it uh, to maximum 15 minutes because we will have to then move to our uh, third keynote speaker at uh, approximately half past 11. Thank you, Thank very, you very much, much for, for joining us. And yes, go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank you very much for the second try. And I'm really sorry uh, for not being able to share my slides before. And I'm trying to rush now a little bit through the, the slides. Could you go to the next uh, slide and the next one? I'd like to start when talking about alpine tourism with some preliminary remarks, because usually we think about the, the Alps as one unique um, geographical area and also one unique tourism area. So speaking about the alpine tourism, which usually gives a completely wrong picture. Next slide, please. Because, uh, I mean, looking to the population, it's quite obvious that the inner alpine area is not that densely populated. So the, the uh, difference in the density is uh, very high in the, uh, between the inner and the, the outer Alps, which was also, next slide, the the, the development in the, in the recent years. Interestingly enough, before 2000, we had the, the same population development, meaning people moving from the inner, inner parts of the Alps to the outskirts. From 2000 on, we have a different 
uh, alpine development, the western parts uh, now increasing population even within the Alps. Next slide, please. But when talking about the alpine tourism, uh, we know that tourism in the Alps is still a very important aspect of, of economy. And worldwide, before COVID, we had approximately between 10 and 12% of all international overnight stays in the Alpine region. But looking to the tourism intensity, here you see the, the number of beds per inhabitant. You immediately see that there is also huge differences. The more whiter parts have nearly no beds. The more intensive, the darker green parts have high number of beds per inhabitant. Next slide, please. Which is also valid at the end for the uh, really the importance of um, tourism as an economic sector in terms of employment. Uh, percentage in the hotelry and gastronomy. The darker the area is, the higher the percentage of uh, provided jobs in the industry is, which means you see also very bright areas where tourism has not really an increasing importance or in, in large importance. We know that at the end, 10% of all the municipalities in the Alps, uh, which is approximately 88% of the population, have an increase, have any importance of tourism that is very high. Roughly half of the of the of the uh, uh, municipalities have covering five percent of all the beds, and thirty seven percent of all municipalities have no single touristic offer, no single touristic bed at least. Next slide, please. Next, click on it. Yeah. We did a comparison about the um, the change in the population between 2006 and 16 and the tourism intensity. And what you see in red is touristic areas. And this is the 20 strongest, uh, according to the number of overnight stays, the 20 strongest communities in Austria. And out of the 20 strongest communities, more than half of it have a decreasing population. Next click, please. Next click. And especially if you look to those areas that have up to 20% of decreasing population within 20 years, you see that's the most strongest uh, winter proportion of, of tourism. So the result here is that depending on the local circumstances, tourism is not really uh, increasing the local economy in terms of uh, job creation for locals. But on the other hand, also tourism is depending on, or it's relevant for the increasing of the, of the local prices for living and the local prices for building houses. That means at the end, young people cannot afford to stay in the region because they cannot afford to buy a flat or to build an own house. And so they're moving out. So you really, at the end, and this is first message here, next slide, please is that we need to look very carefully to the individual community situation when we discuss the tourism development, which also goes now into the post-COVID development. Next slide, please. And I can slightly or briefly also answer the, the question that was passed to my, to the further, to the uh, former speaker. Yes, also in Austria, we had the best August ever, but this is, um, just the overnight numbers, it's not the turnover. We had the fact that many of the hotels decreased the prices a lot. So the income and the turnover would not reach the previous August. One argument. The second argument is that we still see a lot of bookings that where people are basically interested in international tourism, but due to the uncertain situation in other countries, they change their mind and they do stay either in Austria or in the, in the uh, nearby uh, neighboring markets. Last but not least, August is only, uh, nope. <laughs> Last but not least, August is only holidays and not conference tourism usually. And the biggest decrease in tourism we definitely will have in the city tourism and in the, in the conference tourism, what's not so relevant for, for the August. So my focus is that I doubt that this a uh, very positive picture at the moment will, will stay. Next slide, please. 
So I do think that it's rather a catching up for the moment. This was exactly what we've seen already in, in May when, for example, Mallorca opened. We did have some flight shaming in the, in the recent years. Nevertheless, Mallorca was immediately full. So everyone was flying to, to Mallorca. So in my understanding, it's quite questionable if we have this uh, change in the consumer's behavior on the long term. Next slide, please. And additionally, what we see that is for the for some destinations very relevant that we have some uncertainties when it comes to the Asian, especially for the Chinese market. I'm also teaching in China, and what I hear from my friends there is that they at the moment have a very negative picture about uh, European politics, so that we have been not strict enough in the pandemic situation. And so many Chinese at the moment, and maybe some of the audience participants can confirm that. Um, would be afraid of going to Europe. And what we also see is that uh, the Chinese tourism policy at the moment tries to strengthen the, the domestic market, so strengthen Chinese um, destinations. So in my understanding, this is a huge uncertainty for some of the intensively uh, intensive used um, alpine destinations. Next slide, please. We do have a uh, declining mice uh, market and uh, city tourism. All the studies that we have access to at the moment speak of an expectations of a minus of roughly 20% in the, in the mice and conference market, which will hit mainly the, the smaller and middle-sized conferences. We know about several of the Congress centers in touristic areas that have an additional uh, focus uh, aside the, the uh, business, uh, aside the holiday makers, that they already think about other forms of how they could use the existing Congress centers. Next point, please. Next slide, please. Um, my personal approach is, my personal focus is that cruise tourism will decline because of the target group. It's very often the 65 plus age group, which is now after the pandemic, very keen on, on security issues and safety issues, and would be a little bit afraid of being stuck in a, in, uh, a huge mass in, in such facilities like cruise ships. So this could strengthen the, the Alpine and the, the nearby uh, neighboring markets. Next slide, please. You see, I'm rushing a little bit through the, the slides. I apologize again for that. The chance that I do see in the Alps is the, the focus on health tourism, on the increasing demand for nearness, for regionality, also for safety. Next slide, please. So those destinations that, it's a little bit slow in the change. Uh, so those destinations that can guarantee um, high safety standards, um, regional products, the approach to health tourism, and then overall regional, not too dense, uh, not too intensive tourism offer could really be the winners after the, the destination. But we, next slide, please. We still have two more um, questionable parts, which is on the one hand, the labor shortage. This was already here before the, the crisis. We know that the tourism in the Alps is not the most um, recommended uh, employer, that especially young people, local young people often do not want to work in tourism because of the unfriendly uh, working hours for families, because of lack of respect, et cetera. This labor shortage was increased due to the pandemic. We know several cases at the moment where hotels reopened now, but can only use 70, 75% of the uh, capacities because of a shortage in their uh, staff. And actually the situation is that many hotels cannot find enough uh, employees. So this will lead to a reduction in the services. Receptions might not open, might not be open with uh, weekends. Um, restaurants are changing from a la carte menus to Buffets, etc. So this will be really one of the important issues that we need to tackle. Next slide, please. And what's completely uncertain? Yeah, okay. 
Uh, and what's completely uncertain is the, at the end, the, the young generation. Um, on the one hand, we have Greater and Fridays for Future, which would give us big hope for a more climate friendly traveling behavior. But on the other hand, we had a study done at the Austrian University that showed amongst the students, even amongst the tourism students, that uh, they are well aware of the, the climate challenges, but they're not really willing to change their travel behavior. Next slide, and then this would be the last slide. So I'm stopping in the middle of my uh, prepared presentation. So the, my opinion here would be that uh, the tourism industry should not wait for the consumer's demand for more sustainability, but really looking forward to own responsibility and do a transformation towards more sustainability. Just to take the example from the car industry, if we would have waited for the drivers to reduce CO2 emissions, uh, we would not have the Euro 5 or Euro 6 exhaust regulation by now. So it needs definitely political frameworks and it needs the responsibility of the industry. And when it comes to political frameworks, this is what we analyzed now in the reaction during and after the COVID uh, pandemic. We do not see really that the political frameworks are going into more transformation towards more sustainability. I would have, have some slides uh, analyzing or presenting this analysis, which I cannot go into by now. I'm sorry again for the technical problems and for this quickly rushing through that, but thank you very much for the opportunity. And maybe I'm, there are some questions that I could answer in the chat. Thank you very much, Professor Baumgartner, for your talk. Well, if there are any uh, questions to Professor Baumgartner, we can probably take one question, uh, either live or through chat. Uh, and of course, through chat, we could also invite our presenters to um, answer any questions in the chat uh, as we have to proceed. In the meantime, perhaps we should ask uh, Claudia, our previous speaker, to maybe answer uh, another question that was posted in the chat. Uh, which says, uh, dear Claudia, what strategies do you think? A question by Riza Barani, an interesting question. Uh, what strategies do you think we can take to convince people spend more money on sustainable tourism? Perhaps a quick answer, Claudia, if you'd like to. Uh, can you just repeat the beginning of the question? I didn't, which? Yes, what strategies do you strategies. think we okay. can take? Sorry. Yeah, okay. I uh, didn't hear the strategy. So our approach is really to um, say we need to be sustainable as a destination with a high quality of the products we offer, um, which is high product quality, regional, seasonal food and all those things that um, hotels and gastronomy can do belongs also in it as also like um, encouraging our partners to um, yeah, to use their old recipes to maintain their, their traditions in the future, because we say you a, have to look at the product that you sell, and that of course has to be high product, but we also want to bring our traditions into the future, which is a big issue for us in sustainability, and we believe if we can encourage our hotels, partners, uh, everybody in the tourism industry to, to make good quality products and offers, then in the end we um, yeah, that's our strategy to bring it in the in the future. And we believe that people are willing to pay for good quality and um, for, yeah, encountering that uh, Bavarian way of life, lifestyle here, and then also willing to pay for it. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, dear Claudia. Well, we have to proceed now to our uh, next and uh, last uh, keynote uh, in this session. And this is my great pleasure to invite uh, Professor Lisa T. Weinen, uh, who is a research professor in outdoor recreation and nature-based tourism at Natural Resources Institute in Finland. She leads research work dealing with health benefits of nature, outdoor recreation, nature-based tourism, and develops collaborative models between forestry and nature-based tourism with her team. Um, Professor Tivainen will give us a talk on health benefits from nature implications to tourism development or nature-based tourism development. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this uh, morning, Professor Tivainen, and the floor is yours. Please take yes. over. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, good morning, everyone, uh, dear colleagues uh, to, in, in tourism research and, and practice. 
Uh, regards from Zurich, I'm actually sitting in the office in uh, in in uh, VSL in, in Zurich for this autumn. Normally, I work in Helsinki. So uh, let me share my my screen. I hope it goes uh, smoothly. Mm, yes. I wonder if the, it's okay now. Yes, everything's perfect. Yes. Please go ahead. So, uh, I'm going to uh, give you a brief introduction uh, to what do we know about health benefits of nature and discuss how uh, we could use this information in nature-based tourism and, and tourism de development, mainly nature-based tourism development. And uh, just one second, I need to modify my my screen a bit to see what I have here. Um, well, I will go on. So some some background. We 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 know already from from a rather long research history that really uh, nature areas provide important public health benefits. These benefits are can be gained from urban green areas, all types of green areas in rural and, and in urban, urban setting. But I would say also here that outdoor recreation and nature-based tourism are the key channels to deliver these benefits and nature-based tourism uh, really has, has uh, big potential in, 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 in uh, providing more of these type of services. We have uh, been working in the Nordic country, or we, I participated in a, in a bigger bio tour project in Norway, and we did a trend uh, study, what uh, the, the experts in different countries see will be uh, a rising uh, trend in the future. We got a few trends there, there were Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, Switzerland and Oregon State involved and, and health and well-being was one of the rising trends uh, in tourism. Uh, all in, in all countries, sustainability was definitely the thing that, that this expert mentions and uh, this digital needs for digitalization and, and more diverse products here. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this area has been studied maybe uh, in a growing uh, way for 15 years and this health benefits of nature has, has climbed higher up in European policy agendas. We had a first European research uh, big network which finished its work, finished, it, finished its work 2010 uh, with, a, with a book about what we know about health benefits of nature. Then there are other summary work ordered by European uh, Environmental uh, uh, Directorate. Uh, World's uh, Health Organization had summed up uh, the, the, the health, health benefits of nature. And as I mentioned, I will, I will uh, try to sum up this research event evidence here. So if we take a look at uh, the challenges, why health is so important? It's, it's individually uh, important for, for almost, well, I could say everyone, but it's also important for the societies. And we, we see increasing uh, physical, mental health problems, and there's a list in the middle, uh, which show this uh, our lifestyle uh, diseases, uh, uh, big mental health problems uh, in in in, in uh, developed societies, cardiovascular diseases are also linked to to uh, chronic stress and also uh, un unhealthy diets, but also in activity, inadequate physical exercises is behind this and, and the costs are huge in, uh, in mental health care and, and there are some economic figures that, that uh, show that 
there's really uh, we are spending a lot to 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 uh, tackle the these diseases, but we should more uh, talk about and concentrate on how we prevent these these kind of problems. And and uh, alone, these uh, mental health benefits are, are take up a huge budget from from healthcare. Here we have a. Uh, I don't know, this is a little bit now. Okay, it's better. So uh, here we have a, a figure showing where these health benefits from nature are coming from. There are five channels identified in research. They are here in a blue color. Firstly, nature is a healthy environment. There's less noise air is uh, more pure, uh, this stress reduction restorative capacity of nature is, is well studied. So when people get outside into nature, uh, the, the, the uh, nerve system starts to react to that very quickly. Also uh, physical activity of uh, nature provides really uh, multiple uh, possibilities for being physically active and play outdoors, social contacts, uh, many need some their, of their own time, uh, nature provides privacy, peace and quietness, and also uh, nature is contact, nature contact is, is shown to improve human immune function and to resist uh, uh, some uh, non-communicable diseases. Of course, uh, these benefits come from repeated use and, and uh, tourism trips can play a part of it in, in, in delivering these health benefits. But okay, we, we take a little bit uh, bigger look on what, what is it when we talk about health. This is a uh, Food and Agricultural Research Organization's recent uh, study where was I was involved in uh, writing the summary of health benefits for forests, but we also need to think about uh, the nature's role in providing uh, sources for, for medicines, plants but in particular uh, are, are very important, have an important role in, in supporting uh, medication, food, healthy food, uh, non-wood products, forest products, for example, berries, mushrooms, everything, they are very high, high, have high nutritious value. And of course, this kind of uh, uh, food is very important in developing countries, but the, 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 there are more and more people coming uh, into this field to study more, more uh, in depth uh, how nature and, and human health uh, uh, interaction and what, what does it, how does it go and, and, and what are the, the benefits for humans and what we should do, how should we take care of all the nature, take care of the nature also. So uh, some, some slides about what do we know about the impacts. The impacts on mental health are our best studied area. Uh, even in a, some minutes or let's say in 15 minutes, we, we can show that uh, the, the emotions, positive emotions are, start to come back and, uh, and the stress reduction uh, happens quite quickly. Uh, also, if we think about our capacity to, to work or study, uh, these uh, visits to nature improve uh, attention restoration. We have the skill, we get our, our energy and, and skills back to, for example, during a work day or after holiday, we are better equipped to, to start the work again. And we also know that rural nature areas where nature-based tourism is, is operating, uh, they, they have uh, more better qualities uh, than urban green areas, which are often quite small and, and uh, don't offer these this high qualities what we can offer in, in, for example, in protected areas. Also, these uh, health effects have been measured uh, quite a lot uh, physio physiologically. Uh, there's less evidence in that. Most studies are conducted in Asia, but there's a good evidence base from this is too that 
uh, this uh, relaxation and restoration has been measured in, in uh, uh, reduced stress hormones, blood pressure, uh, reducing pul pulse rate, uh, muscle tension, and so on. So, so there's a good evidence at, uh, for for tourists to show that that we can we can claim that visit to nature improves your health and well-being. Uh, one example from Helsinki, one of our biggest experiments, how we have conducted these studies. Uh, we did this with our Japanese uh, colleagues who have been doing a lot of, a lot of research in Japan in, in creating health forests there. And uh, so we brought close to 100 people in Helsinki after work to three different environments, to Helsinki city center, to a big urban park and then to Helsinki Central Park, which is 1,000 hectare big area. And we asked people to sit 15 minutes and then walk half an hour slowly. slowly. And we could uh, find that even uh, this, in these 15 minutes, uh, uh, we could uh, show clear improvement for perceived restorativeness in green areas in both this big park and, and uh, this big forest and also these uh, heart rate uh, measures and uh, blood pressure measures support the, this relaxation and this big forest was uh, in this experiment uh, somewhat better than the big urban park and also these physical activity benefits are very important and uh, very attractive for many people and uh, the, the having been active in nature has uh, added value to other uh, benefits of physical exercise, being fit and, and improving your health. Uh, that's that's very well studied area, but, but you get also on top of that the mental health benefits. And there are many international studies on, on showing this effect. And of course, people have uh, individual preferences where they want to visit, what areas they want to visit and how they want to move. But anyway, the, the, the research evidence is rather solid in, in this area too. Also, social benefits are important for when people go out. In particular, for women, companies more important uh, due to feelings of safety. And okay, as in everything else, shared nature experience are important uh, in, in tourism visits. But if you want to get these mental health benefits, uh, this solitude seems to be a little bit more better that you focus on the environment and, and not, not that you, you get the full uh, benefits from, from the environment and, and concentrate on that, that uh, is shown to boost these mental health benefits and, and uh, uh, this capacity to, to, to regain the capacity for directed attention. And, and the last uh, channel, which is uh, increasing studies, is that uh, nature contact is uh, suggested to diversify uh, human microbiota on skin and in uh, and uh, in the whole body, uh, intestinal system also. And uh, one of the key explanations is is to be exposed to uh, to be somehow exposed to soil microorganisms one way or another, eating berries or or, or collecting mushrooms. Uh, touching the plants and eating herbs uh, and so on. So this is very fascinating thing that, that, that as, uh, in Finland we work quite a lot uh, with that bringing nature more back into the cities, even more we have quite green cities and, and uh, organizing outdoor play for kids more and more. And uh, of course there are individual differences, as I mentioned already, uh, and that has to be taken into account when, when uh, we design these uh, products and services providing health benefits for people. And another 
aspect what we need to take into account is that there are uh, dangers in, in uh, nature, tick-borne diseases, risk of injuries, and, and so on. And of, of course, this has to be kept in mind and people have to be instructed how to how to behave and, and these uh, tourism packages have to be guided so that, that everything is safe. So if we take a look at the national parks in Finland, what, uh, how this uh, health and well-being has been integrated there, we'll be monitoring uh, the, the visits to, to um, in these parks already for 20 years and uh, we have 40 national parks and entrepreneurs are committed to sustainable tourism principles and we have uh, uh, the national parks all over in Finland and we saw uh, last year that these visits to national parks increased 23 percent which is a huge uh, increase and uh, we have divided this, this uh, recent analysis, these parks into different categories. We see that uh, in Lapland and in other, other tourism destinations, the visitations have uh, constantly increased, but also this, these uh, uh, parks in cities, near cities are attracting more people. And here you see uh, in this blue, blue uh, bar, uh, line, your big, big shift uh, also, already yes during this uh, pandemic and people were a lot of people were looking for uh, health and well-being benefits getting uh, stress reduction and so on this motivation increased and have increased also already during the past 10 years but but pandemic increased this demand for health and well-being and there are also a big change in diversity of of activities in, in uh, Finnish national parks and, and really uh, the users mention very often uh, that, that the health and well-being are, are one of the key, key uh, motivation for them to visit the parks. And also pandemic uh, ch has changed at least the Finns but also many other uh, national people uh, in, in many other countries, people skew about nature. Here we have a national study, uh, say, asking, uh, we, we do outdoor recreation inventory in Finland, we ask that during our survey, how people feel about nature after or because of pandemic, and almost half of Finns stated that their appreciation has increased and nature has become more place for reducing stress for the one. Uh, people are more active there and so on. At least there's been a uh, pandemic has maybe stopped people to think about, and this is also shown in service, what is important and, and, and uh, there's more and more focus on, on health and well-being. So if there is an uh, increased demand for health from nature, so what, what should we do? How should we develop the products and services? And there are suggestions that actually uh, enterprises uh, could become, provide more of this type of uh, services that, that support health. And, but also this type of development, uh, we would need to think more about what do we need to do to sustain the nature values in sites? Because we know that there are there's been too many visitors in some uh, hotspots and uh, nature trampling and uh, this congestion uh, is is uh, not good for nature, but it's not good for uh, health benefits or the nature experiences. So we need to take a closer look at that. If we quickly see uh, an example uh, from Finland, uh, uh, around five years ago, uh, there was a, a roadmap for tourism. Finland launched, launched that and well-being tourism was identified uh, one of the top uh, themes that Finland wanted to uh, focus on. And uh, here are some examples of how you can package, uh, one can package uh, the products. 
based on well-being in Finland. And we have one of the pillars here is this uh, well-being from forest benefits, pure water, air, exercise in nature, and just being in the beautiful nature to have this restorative uh, effect. And of course, combined with healthy food, uh, using our berries, herbs, everything, uh, these fresh uh, things what we get from, from our nature. And also Finnish sauna has been rather recently studied that it, it's, it's healthy and uh, providing also uh, relaxation and, and all this combination of these, these aspects uh, can, can, uh, is, is forming a good, good uh, basis for product development. But, but as we know that in, in, in nature-based tourism is, is a, it's a growing area and we need uh, thinking about the, the product development and, and in a country like Finland, how we improve accessibility. One of our big challenges has been to, to create collaboration with, with the small and, and medium-sized uh, entrepreneurs, more networking, doing more marketing and sales, but, but really uh, the last uh, year's discussion has been, has been very much that we need to focus on, on responsible tourism as a cross-cutting principle. Our nature is, is quite fragile and, and we need to monitor the use of it and, and the visitor flows in nature areas in order to, to, to have a long-term uh, good uh, growth in this area. And this nature doesn't have to be uh, uh, always visited in rural areas. We have great areas, uh, for example, Helsinki and uh, this is an example from uh, Old Town Bay in Helsinki, which is our oldest nature re reserve there. And, uh, city decided to uh, improve access to this uh, bird wetland uh, by constructing a lapland nature trail and access uh, improve the, the, the access to health and well-being benefits for locals but also for tourists and uh, also part of this uh, project was raising awareness of the, the really attractive areas what we have in Helsinki and, uh, and uh, provide, for example, this uh, mobile application where you can uh, find the 10 uh, most attractive uh, city nature in Helsinki. And, and so people visiting Helsinki, the urban, the urban our biggest city, so also can, can enjoy health and well-being benefits from, from, uh, from nature areas in Helsinki. And one question I wanted to uh, raise here is uh, what is actually the role of tourism in, in, in implementing in the sustainable development goals in the future? Uh, they often link to employment, growth, uh, uh, providing jobs, uh, climate change, yes, uh, in, in many countries uh, already probably. Uh, identified, I was reading the Norwegian uh, tourism strategy yesterday, but, but uh, this health and well-being uh, is not there uh, in, in nature-based tourism. I, I think it's a quite evident target or could be we strengthen uh, uh, to focus more on this in our, on our products or market, market the, the good products, what there are already for, for clients. And then I would raise these two, two other targets uh, by pro, uh, protecting biodiversity and, and in, on, on, in waters and on, on terrestrial ecosystems. I think uh, nature-based tourism should, should take a better role in, in contributing a more active role and think about it how, how tourism could it, contribute to sustaining this, this our key attraction factor. And uh, an example of how this can be done is, is from Finland in, in our national parks. Uh, we have had already 10 years this Healthy Park, Healthy People initiative. 
that uh, talks about uh, the health benefits from nature to people and how these uh, protected areas uh, provide uh, home for, for species and uh, animals and plants, but also a uh, very healthy environment for, for, for people. And uh, Metsa Halitus, who is managing these areas, has been uh, actually surveying how uh, people experience these uh, these health and well-being benefits and, and the, the, the results are very, very good. 88% uh, of visitors feel that they, they, uh, a visit to the National Park has a fairly or very high impact on their health and well-being. So this, is, this monitoring goes on and is done in all, all 40 pro national parks in Finland. So if we want to produce more health benefits. So, so uh, one thing is to, to really uh, contribute to maintaining the, the nature areas and help the uh, managers of these areas to, to, to manage them, uh, uh, to have money to manage them and, and monitor the, the, the visitor flows. And also we have to understand the visitors' demands and, and capacities and skills what can they do in the forest, what they want to do. Um, I have heard uh, more and more often that people want to rest and relax and not so much on these activities, but really calm down. This uh, uh, tells very much of these mental health problems that people need space just to be and, 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 and uh, recover from a daily, daily stress. And we need more collaboration with both with natural resource, uh, uh, sector and, and with health, health and well-being sector. And uh, I like the discussion where from the previous presenters that we need to pay more actively, uh, more, more uh, attention to sustainability. How can we do it? We need uh, longer stays, uh, less long distance traveling, a combine a city and uh, city visitors uh, provide them also nature nature based services uh, as a part of their visit combine leisure and work find new target groups and uh, really increase efforts to create responsible tourism services and uh, finally, I'd like to say that uh, nature is open for new ideas and, and we can be innovative. There's a, here is an example from Lahti, city of Lahti in, in Finland, who, who is providing uh, these uh, distant workplaces for people uh, in, the, in the big uh, city green areas. And uh, I think it's a really very, very charming uh, innovation that people can can go and maybe work one day per week in a in a setting like this to to and and you are in an environment then you where you will recover quickly and and yeah feel fresh after the working day uh i hope i have uh, not exceeded my time very much uh thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Lisa. Actually, it was perfect timing. We're just on time. In the meantime, we have one question uh, from the audience in chat, and I'm going to read it now. Um, Thank you. It's a question from uh, Vandenberg. Thank you for this healthy presentation. Indeed, a very healthy presentation. Yes. As nature attracts more people for all the reasons you exposed, how are we going to cope with pollution issues? Are all tourism economic actors aware of that? What efforts are already being made in Finland? At what cost for the regions? Yes, that's a very good question. And uh, I think we need to rethink how much each destination can take what kind of tourists are fit there and, and uh, how do we educate the visitors? And uh, in a way, this is a really tricky question. In Finland, we have, a, uh, we have a campaign where, uh, if, where people visiting nature are encouraged to bring all the garbage back. So we don't have a garbage 
pins, for example, there anymore. And so educate people what you take there, you get them out. Also, uh, we need more monitoring uh, the visitor flows, what goes on the, the uh, monitoring of the quality of nature. We have this limits of acceptable change system in our national parks. We monitor uh, if, if there's too many people, uh, congestion, uh, the, the paths are widening and uh, there is disturbance to animals. And then we, we do planning where people can go and then some areas are, we use this uh, zoning system in, in planning. So I think we need to, these nature areas are coming more and more valuable. And, and there are of course limits, what, what, how many, how much use there can be. And in Nordic countries, we have experienced uh, too high peaks uh, and too many visitors at sites and dangerous situations, so on. And, and this, this is definitely uh, need more attention. So I think we need to educate people also to, to take care of, uh, of the nature and, uh, and, and encourage them uh, to, to support also nature and, and donate to nature protection and this type of things. We have some research done recently on that. Very many things need to be done. <laughs> no problem. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Um, in the meantime, uh, I want to ask another question, if I may, myself being a health professional and also interested in cross-border healthcare and in uh, health tourism, medical tourism. And you already mentioned, uh, even before, before I, I mean, as I was planning my question, you mentioned that uh, this uh, the, that the, the tourism sector also perhaps needs uh, more cooperation or more interface with the health sector. So that would be my question. Uh, do you think it's, uh, there is a need to, for example, to raise awareness among the health professionals about the benefits of nature, um, uh, nature effects, uh, the, the effects of nature, I mean, the benefits of this uh, kind of activities uh, uh, for, for the patients in various domains? Do you think there is enough awareness among uh, health professionals? Do you think doctors often recommend um, travel and being uh, in a natural environment to uh, their, um, let's say, customers, so to say, yes. or patients? Or do you think uh, more can be done with that regard? And if more can be done, that, then what would be, let's say, a few things to consider? How would yeah. you more interact with the uh, healthcare professionals, with the healthcare industry? Thank you. Oh, very good point. And definitely we need this, this uh, work more. We uh, started this in uh, 2014 and when we, we organized a series of seminars about the health benefits of nature and invited doctors there. And we got a couple of uh, people involved and then we, we, we started to do pilots, how we can uh, bring, for example, uh, mental health, dep depression uh, patients or type two diabetes patients to forest. And we got some uh, interested individual as doctors doing that, pres prescribing that. And we have established uh, this type of systems and it's been spreading in Finland. And uh, we started also cooperation with medical society Duodecim in Finland with the doctors and they were interested in, in health benefits of forests and we write it together a summary of, of the research information with the doctors and has have published that 2018 and I've been speaking in medical uh, seminars and conferences in Finland which is has was a big step because uh, as you know, medical sector is very close. They are looking for evidence base. And that's why I, I'm talking a lot about evidence base. And we have a lot good evidence base. For tourism, it's not so uh, heavy uh, demands. But we are, we are, we are getting uh, better, I think. And I've, I've been contacted uh, last year with quite many doctors that they say, I want to promote this. So the word is spreading. And, and ordinary people discuss this a lot, that it's very much written in the public media and newspapers and so on. So I think it's possible, but it needs 
these interested in individuals to start spreading, spreading the word. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. I would very much agree with you. It needs uh, it needs uh, uh, leadership uh, and uh, you know uh, enthusiasts uh, uh, on both sides, so to say, of the equation, both from the tourism sector and also from from the uh, health healthcare industry for uh, medical sector. And I would very much uh, like to reciprocate to to agree to to your point that it also needs uh, perhaps even more uh, research quality research you know in order to be able to show to to show improved outcomes uh, from these um interventions as we medics call it because it's, it's essentially also intervention right and then with uh, <clears throat> when hopefully the the research base uh, is uh, further expanded i am assuming that it uh, should be possible even to integrate uh, these sort of activities into the recommendations and formal guidelines for management of various patients Absolutely. Uh, thank you very and much. I think it's uh, not yet possible, but, but there are more uh, medical scientists also coming into this field. But tourism can provide all this evidence already because the people can feel the experience by themselves. And that's the key outcome. And, and there is a demand. So that's an easier thing for, for tourism than for traditional healthcare sector. Exactly, exactly. And I'm pleased here to say and, uh, well, permit me to say that uh, uh, our team, let's say, at uh, uh, the Faculty European Campus Rob Tallinn here of the Degendorf Institute of Technology could also be a sort of uh, an example of this sort of cooperation you know, between health professionals, because that is one of our unique features. We uh, combine uh, health and uh, health-related uh, study courses, such as uh, digital health or health informatics, with uh, tourism-related study cor courses, of course, linked through health and medical tourism under the same roof. And uh, that is that uh, provides us uh, with uh, additional um, opportunities, you know, to integrate, to find the interfaces and uh, to collaborate between the two uh, sectors, of course, uh, for the benefits uh, of, uh, of everyone, of uh, patients, of uh, citizens, and of course, also for travelers. All right. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your you. uh, fantastic talk, for your insights, for your comments. I would like to thank again our uh, all our three speakers uh, for uh, accepting our invitation to uh, be a part uh, of this conference, for sharing their insights, uh, for sharing their experience. Uh, I would like to also say a great thank you to, to our audience, to, to all of you, to everyone who participated in this session and who actively engaged in the session. I would like to once again apologize for these uh, technical issues that we've had in the, the beginning of the session. And on that, I'm going to close this session. I'm wishing all of you uh, the uh, very interesting and informative uh, continuation of this conference. And above all, be healthy, be safe, and uh, resume traveling or continue to travel. Thank you very much and goodbye. So after the break, we're going for a break now and uh, um, permit me to share this uh, screen now. So after the break, uh, those uh, who uh, remain in this uh, uh, room in Resilience Auditorium will uh, uh, proceed to the next uh, keynote session that will begin at uh, 1 p.m. So, hello. Good afternoon, good morning, maybe good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to the second part of Turin's Naturally Online Symposium. Uh, I hope you had a fantastic lunch break. I hope you enjoyed the morning sessions, which were related very much to um, industry practitioners, top academic research, cutting edge uh, knowledge that is currently available. And now I would like to invite you to a little bit different perspective. So we have already started discussing that uh, technologies right now, including smart technologies and multiple sensors, they do revolutionize the way how tourism industry works. And I am absolutely delighted to have an opportunity to invite one of the global leaders in uh, neuromarketing research and biometric technologies, which are available right now, the future is now, to observe human behavior, to uh, uh, evaluate, to
tourists' emotions and experiences to better understand what they actually feel, what they think, how they perceive tourist products. So please welcome our guest, iMotions, which is a global leader in your marketing software. They are developers of the software, and they are also the leaders in research and consultancy in this field. Paolo, Jessica, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Katerina. I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. There we go. Are we good to go? Yes, we are. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our session today, and thank you so much for coming by and, uh, and seeing what we have to offer. Um, my name is Jessica, and I'm joined by my colleague, Paolo. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about ourselves and, and our background before we get into the meat of things. Um, so I'm currently the technical director of iMotions North America. Uh, my background is in neuroscience and in research. Uh, about a lifetime ago, I was studying Parkinson's disease in, 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 in individuals, um, and I've been doing research for a little over a decade uh, in multiple different models um, and different scenarios, and it's really my passion and my privilege to be able to help bring these technologies to new industries and to really bridge that gap between the kinds of things I was doing in academic research and bringing them to you know, different industry verticals and all sorts of different manifestations and sort of seeing what's possible um, with neuroscience and industry. Paolo, would you like to say something? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Paolo, and I'm uh, connecting from the iMotions office in Copenhagen, Denmark. And yeah, as you can see from the slide, my background is more from the math and uh, data uh, perspective. Um, and uh, with iMotions, I've been working for several years now with the uh, biosensors and modeling of the signals we can collect with such sensors, especially in a mobile context, which is what I'm going to tell you more about today. Awesome. So just as a little bit of background as to why we're even speaking at this at this conference, um, I think this is a really exciting field with a lot of potential. And the way we sort of wanted to frame it at the very beginning is from the lens of attention and emotion. Now, attention and emotion are really um, integral to the tourism experience in multiple ways. So for me, if I'm booking a vacation, there's many different elements where these factors can come into play. First off, it's thinking about the kinds of destinations that I want to look at. So as I'm going flipping through my options, what places look attractive to, uh, to me? What um, places appeal to me on a personal level? It could be going to a cottage for a weekend, visiting someplace really exotic, or going to someplace with awe-inspiring views. All of these can mean different things to me at different times. Once I pick my destination and make that choice, then I have to think about logistics. What's the best way to get there? Are there certain you know, elements that are really attractive to me, like a, a scenic tour through the countryside, or are there things a little bit more anxiety inducing? Maybe I have a fear of flights and that's going to impact how I look at things. Once I figure out how I get to my destination, then it's all of the fun stuff, the actual experience that I'm going to have. And for me, you know, that that's going to be food. That's always going to matter a lot to me. But for many other people, um, it, it can mean many different things. It can mean the places that you're going to be staying at. And it could be the goal that you have going into a particular place. Are you going to be looking for something really exciting, like going whitewater rafting? Or do you really just want to be on a beach alone, just peace and quiet? And, and all of these mean different things to different people, again, at different times. And they're all going to affect the kinds of decisions that we make and the kinds of feelings and anticipation that we have when booking um, an actual experience. Now, emotions at the end of the day are how we assign labels to good and bad, and that ultimately drives decision-making. So for me, you know, if you present a nice piece of cake in front of me, I'm going to assign that with the label of good. But if you give me you know, a piece of stinky cheese, I might assign the label of bad to that. But Emotions are also heavily context dependent and they're extremely flexible. So say I might go to France and end up doing a, a cheese tour and I'm presented with a piece of stinky cheese that I actually think is amazing, then we can change our good and bad labels depending on our experiences, depending on our memories, our preconceptions, and the, you know, the kinds of um, experience and new information that we use to take in. So ultimately, emotion and attention help to tag information as relevant. 
And this is really important in the hospitality experience uh, in several dimensions. But first off, you have a particular stimulus that is going to trigger a certain response um, that is then going to be incorporated in wider storage. So sort of the engram of memories that you create as you go through a particular experience, as you with your family, as you're doing something amazing or seeing something awe inspiring, all of this comes together into ultimately, you know, the experiences, the sights, the smells, the sounds, all of that um, that happens within tourism, within travel, within that experience. So usually, you know, when we try to assess emotion and attention, and we do that a lot over here at iMotions, the most common and, and easiest method to actually assess people's behavior is simply to ask, hey, what did you think of that? Uh, or why did you make that decision? Or what drove you towards this place or towards this item? And uh, self-report is definitely easy to work with, but it also has its caveats. Um, frankly, you know, you're dealing with our own internal biases, our own internal attitudes, our memories, or our recall of an event. Even the lexicon, like the language that we use to describe our emotions, can often differ between people. Some people don't have the right verbiage to be able to talk about what they're really feeling internally. Even things like language barriers, which is something that you probably deal with quite often in the hospitality industry, is something that we also have to contend with when talking about describing what's going on internally, what we pay attention to, what we react to. So this is really where biological signals come in and the use of biosensor tools, and we'll go over some examples of these uh, later on, they can really extend these traditional methods by really getting to the meat of what we're feeling or experiencing in the moment. What are we paying attention to? What is the intensity of our reactions? What is the valence of those reactions? And how does that then relate to behavior? So what you're getting at then is sort of the unfiltered physiological response to something in the moment. And with that, we're not trying to replace self-report methods and questionnaires are actually extremely useful. But by having these two methods work in tandem, you get this much more holistic view of how someone is reacting in the moment how that drives decision-making, and then how they then talk about their, their feelings um, subsequently afterwards. So this is where really iMotions comes in. Uh, and we've been around for about 15 years now, specializing in the biosensor space. Um, just in short, you know, how we specialize in this is that, as Katarina mentioned, we are a software platform and we integrate multiple kinds of biosensor inputs, everything from eye tracking, skin conductance, facial expression analysis, heart rate, EEG, and we'll actually get into all of those if you're not familiar with them, um, but we basically put them all into one place and provide an easy platform for you to collect data, analyze data, generate insights, um, and then we also provide consultation to go over what exactly these sensors mean and what they can mean for you and your research. So with that background done, uh, a quick um, sort of overview of what we're going to try and cover over the next 60 to 90 minutes. We're gonna do a quick intro to biosensor tools. Um, this will include eye tracking, facial expression analysis, GSR, EEG, um, heart rate as well, we can touch on that. Then we're going to dive a little bit into biosensors and tourism research and what are some examples that we've seen um, from our clients and just also in the landscape in general. And then we're going to get into how those sensors have evolved given the pandemic. So how do we do research remotely? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about our online data collection module where you can actually deploy studies internationally over the internet. And then Paula will uh, touch on the mobile research platform, uh, which allows you to collect data out in the wild. Uh, and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So with that, let's start with an intro to biosensor tools. And this sort of essential toolbox is great because each tool really gives you a separate piece of information that when you use them all together in tandem, it, it again provides you that sort of holistic view of how someone's reacting in the moment. So our first and most popular um, sort of uh, sensor is eye tracking. And it's also the most common uh, that we really see. And eye tracking is really powerful because it gives you a sense of visual attention or where people are directing their attention. So where are they looking? How long are they looking for? How often do they look in a particular area? And is this something that we can generalize from the individual to the population? So usually this involves a piece of hardware that you would actually stick onto your computer monitor. And what uh, the kinds of data you can get are some really sweet visualizations you can sort of preview up top here. So you can get gaze replays, 
Uh, so that on an individual level, this can tell you where someone is looking at a given time and in what order people look at things within a given scene here. Um, we'll see some examples of that. Um, the, uh, once you have the individual data, you can actually aggregate and get what's called a heat map. And a heat map gives you a nice sort of visual aggregation of where people are focusing their attention most. And this is shown here in color as sort of hot spots. So in this scene of Times Square, you can see that a lot of people are focusing their attention here on sort of the main advertisements in the middle, the Coke sign, uh, and less so on the surrounding advertisements here. But if you do need to have something a bit more quantifiable, so you want to run some statistics and get some actual metrics out of it, you can also draw what are called areas of interest. And this allows you to draw boxes around different elements that you're interested in. And this will derive some specific metrics like how long on average did people take to notice the Coke sign compared to other ads? How much time did people spend looking at the Coke sign compared to other ads? And what percentage of your population actually noticed the Coke ad compared to other ads? So there's a lot of different ways in which you can slice and dice eye tracking data. It's what a lot of our clients end up, uh, end up starting with just because it is so powerful and gives you so much information right off the bat. The reason why eye tracking is also so popular is that it is definitely the most flexible of all of our sensors and you can have eye tracking setups for every kind of study that you can think of. A lot of people will start out with remote or screen based studies. So you'll often see this if you're showing images of destinations or if you have websites um, for booking hotels or experiences. Um, you can have sort of these controlled screen based studies where you can just see where people are looking on the screen. As we get into sort of more in the wild or live collections and Paula will talk a lot about this um, with the mobile platform. But there's also eye tracking glasses that you can wear, which will actually capture what you're looking at as you're navigating a space. And this could be a store, this could be an attraction. We also have options for phone and tablet. And then actually, this is um, a, an option that I'm the most excited about and that we're seeing a lot of advances right now is VR uh, with built in eye tracking. So if you actually want to have virtual experiences of a place, um, and we've tried doing it with Google Earth, that's super cool to work with. Um, you can actually see where people are looking in a custom virtual space and really have that sort of immersive experience as sort of that in between, between like a controlled lab setup and actually physically going to an area. The second sensor that we use is facial expression analysis. And this is really getting at, you know, if I were to crack a smile at a, at a particular scene, you know, when does that happen? How big of a smile is it? And, you know, sort of what elicits that reaction? So we're really sort of getting at the physical, you know, emotional content of the face as it's being shown. And uh, there are several sort of computer learning or computer vision engines on the market that will actually take a webcam feed of an individual and map out the kinds of facial expressions they're making at a given time. And uh, we use one called Affectiva. Uh, this is the main engine that we work with um, in the academic space. And what, uh, what, Af what Affectiva's Aftex engine does is they take a video feed and they isolate the face and sort of map these landmarks on the face. And you'll sort of see an example of that later on. And using computer vision, they're able to essentially see, you know, how are the features of the face moving? and you know, the differences in the textures of the face to output your facial expressions as a probability. So how much, how, how probable are you that you're showing anger, that you're smiling, that you're surprised and so on. One big advantage about Effectiva and a question that we get asked a lot is sort of the validity of the data. And you know, with any AI, the quality of an AI is about as good as the data that you use to train it. So Affectiva's engine is based off of uh, over 6 million faces from 87 different countries. This map gives you sort of an overview of the breakdown. Um, so what you get then is an engine that is representative of a large population, a wide range of ethnicities, a wide range of adult age ranges, um, which makes it really robust uh, for different populations, regardless of who you want to test. The third, the third sensor is skin conductance. And this one looks a little bit more techy. It's this little uh, sort of device here that sort of sits on the wrist. And skin conductance is, all, is also known as galvanic skin response, electrodermal activity. Those are all names for the same thing. 
Um, but what it really gets at is physiological arousal. Uh, so if you were to see something that's really exciting to you, so say there's a sale on a flight that you really want to book and you get really excited, um, or you see, you know, something that is, um, you know, arousing in a negative way, for example, what you get is sort of this internal sympathetic response that includes a slight uptick in your skin sweat. Now, what skin conductance measures is the changes in the conductance of your skin as a function of that skin sweat. And what we're able to see then are sort of these little bumps in your skin conductance that correspond to things that you are reacting to in the moment. So what it really gets at then, if facial expressions give you a sense of valence, whether you're reacting positively or negatively to a stimulus, skin conductance will give you the intensity of that reaction. How excited are you by seeing this experience or by having this interaction? And, uh, and the two together work really well um, within those domains of valence and arousal to get at a sense of how you're reacting in the moment. We'll, bre we'll sort of breeze through the rest. Um, eye tracking, facial expressions, and skin conductance work really well together as sort of your basic starter. Uh, I like to call them the holy trinity because what you get at is um, attention, valence, and intensity all together in like a really nice little package. And in terms of a learning curve, it's really easy to get started out. Um, but we have advanced tools beyond that we can also dive into. EEG or electroencephalography is a really popular one. Um, you've seen sort of these headsets with those wires coming out the back that look very science fiction-y. Um, but now there's a lot of commercial headsets available that are really easy to work with, easy to put on, uh, very user-friendly. And one of the things that you can get at with EEG is a sense of approach or avoidance motivation. So if I were to see something that I'm extremely drawn to, like I, you know, I see a great photo of Greece and I go, I really want to go to Greece. I really want to go to that place. Or if I see sort of a local food that I think it looks a little bit weird and I go, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if I want to try that. That sort of sentiment of wanting to take action or get away from something is something that can also be measured through EEG. And this is a measure that originally came from the psychological literature, but is now being used in all sorts of different marketing applications. We see it a lot in consumer insights, product testing, video testing, and is easily something that can also be extended to the tourism industry. So with that sort of overview, the thing I really wanna emphasize is that no one sensor is going to do the job completely. Like I said, a lot of these different sensors will each only give you a little piece of the puzzle. And it's really like three blind men and an elephant, you know, where one feels the ears, one feels the tail, one feels the side, and they all say, this is what an elephant is. When you really put it all together, that's when you get the whole elephant. And this is an example um, taken from Nielsen Neuroscience, uh, which is a, a big consumer insights um, company that has labs across the world. They actually did a study, in this case, it was looking at um, product advertisements, but again, this can easily be transferred over to the tourism industry. And what they did is they uh, had participants look at over 60 different advertisements across 20 different product categories and looked at how much each sensor contributed to the variance uh, in terms of their subsequent purchasing behavior. So whether they were likely to actually purchase that product after watching the ad. And if you just look at facial coding alone, it really accounts for less than 10% of the variance. Um, survey, biosensors like skin conductance and EEG, each of these do pretty, they do okay on their own. But when you take the EEG and the biosensors and the facial expressions combined, that accounts for even higher variance. And then when you add survey to the mix, then that accounts for almost 80% of the explained variance in actually looking at the ad and then following through with um, subsequent buying behavior after that. So really, the more information you can sort of add into your model and the more sensors that you can pick that you can pick that fit in within that research question will help give you more information to work with and uh, and this is an approach that we really try to encourage so with that what are some examples that we've already seen in tourism research and i'm going to go through three different examples the first is booking a flight uh, the second is evaluating a hotel and the third is exploring an attraction and some of the stuff that we've done internally, um, others we've seen our clients do, and we'll sort of cite um, specific resources, but this will just give you a little bit of a sense of what people are currently doing, and hopefully give you some ideas for your own research direction on, a place, on places you can take it, um, pardon the pun, I guess, uh, but different directions that you can take your research with these tools. 
So the first is booking a flight. Uh, this is a study that we actually did in-house uh, comparing the usability of three different websites, Virgin, Southwest, and Spirit Airlines. Uh, I'm based in Ohio, as you can tell, so these are all US airlines. Um, but we had these three websites and we evaluated them through three different tasks. Uh, the first is finding the destination map, the usability of that. Second is booking a flight. And the third is finding the cost of checked baggage. Now, I don't know if any of you have actually flown Spirit Airlines before in the US, but it is a little bit of a nightmare. <laughs> Their website is really not that intuitive. And I'll show you a, an example from actually, you know, recording by yours truly. Um, but this is a snippet from our software where you can actually see the brow furrow data here in brown. We have our skin conductance here in blue underneath showing the level of arousal I have in the moment. You have the webcam here showing my reactions to things. There's a little uh, sneak preview of what's going to happen. And then we actually have my experience as I'm going through the website live on the left. So I press play. What we're doing is looking for the cost of checked baggage. And this little bouncy dot moving around is actually the uh, data coming in from the eye tracker. So you can see exactly what I'm interacting with in the moment. And then also we have our mouse movements here that are being logged. Um, when you are looking for the cost of checked baggage on Spirit Airlines, many airlines are, are actually very good about this. They have the pricing upfront if you just know where to find it. With Spirit, they don't actually give you the cost of checked baggage. What you do is you have to fill out this widget here called the Bagotron, where you have to put in your flight information before they tell you how much the bags will actually cost. This is a terrible design decision. Um, first off, because you actually have to have one extra step where you put in your flight information and have to look up the numbers and all that sort of thing to get the info you need. The second is that you might not even have a flight booked. You just want to know how much bags cost. And this is one barrier to you actually getting the information that you need. So you can see here as I interact, I really don't have a good time with this. Um, this is my brow furrow level here. So just the act of bringing my two brows together and the sort of expression of consternation or frustration it's often really um, correlated with negative balance or negative uh, sort of experiences. And what we found is that across all three tasks, Spirit Airlines outperformed the other two websites and the amount of brow furrow elicited by people. Um, this correlated really nicely to the amount of time people took to complete the tasks. It took people a lot longer to finish them on Spirit Airlines compared to the other two. I'll play that again. And, uh, and it also correlated with uh, self-reported ease of use. So when we had people report, you know, how easy was this experience going through each website, Spirit Airlines ranked the lowest, um, again, correlating nicely with the amount of brow furrow people were showing with those tasks. The second example is evaluating hotels. And my, my favorite example comes from Expedia. So Expedia has a very sophisticated usability lab that they've had for several years now. Um, I think they've expanded to other countries. I'm not sure if they've done that. Um, but what they use is a combination of eye tracking and facial expressions. They're not using the webcam base in, the, in this case. They're actually recording the muscle activity from the face directly, but it's really the same thing. And what they're doing is they're just bringing people in, having them book their vacations on Expedia in their lab and seeing for each individual's personal experience, where are they looking and what are they reacting to? The goal is that by getting in as many people as they can to book their vacations, they can actually start drawing generalizations for different, different demographic groups to see what actually in the booking experience are people drawn to? What are they reacting most to? And they can use that to drive insights on the kinds of things that they might want to emphasize for a given demographic moving forward. So one such example is that, um, you know, people from France, for example, tended to smile more or show, or show delight, as they called it, when they saw that there was breakfast available at a hotel. And if they saw photos of lavish spreads of food, people from France tended to respond really well to that. So they saw that they were looking at the food and also eliciting more smiling behavior. So they thought, okay, whenever we have Expedia France, we're gonna really try and highlight the food at a place from here on in. Um, millennials, for example, really enjoyed closet space. So if you were to show a hotel room with a very large closet, people tended to smile more at that. And they're like, okay, for millennial populations, we're gonna make sure that we emphasize uh, closet space from here on in. Um, Well-appointed bathrooms, specific amenities, so by just sort of having this shotgun approach to collecting a ton of data with all of this behavioral input, they can really derive some interesting models 
that can help you know, in design decisions for Expedia's website moving forward, depending on the kind of consumer that's gonna be using your website. The third is exploring an attraction. And I, I wanna cite one of our clients here, which is the Museum of Science in Boston, Massachusetts uh, in the US. So the Museum of Science came to us and said, we're really interested in looking at how our attendees perceive our new exhibits. So what they did is they um, got eye tracking glasses, and skin conductance and we're able to sort of run some more controlled tests of if they were to have a new exhibit on electricity for example that had new interactive elements how often do people attend to the interactive elements versus the text are there elements that really drive a lot of the attention or are there other elements that get ignored and as they change you know different iterations of the exhibit to sort of match you know the feedback they're getting from um, attendees how does that change people's overall experience or perception of that exhibit? And really using sort of this science-driven approach to tweak the kinds of experience and the kinds of, uh, of exhibit that they want their respondents to have. So this is an example of sort of a, re uh, a preview here from eye tracking glasses as someone is coming up to a shelf, for example. And what we're able to do is take that eye tracking data and sort of map it here onto this 2D image what we're able to get then is sort of a heat map of how if people are approaching the shelf, where are they attending to most, what's capturing the most attention, um, how much time are people spending in a given area, and what elements are getting ignored. Now, with these tools, conventionally, we've had people come into the lab to do these kinds of studies. There is stuff that you are going to be putting on people, you know, equipment and so on. And the control of a lab environment is really attractive for a lot of studies. However, with the pandemic and with just sort of the way research has been going in these various fields, there's really been a high demand for being able to do research in a remote setting. And we'll go over two examples of, uh, of this. I'm gonna go through our online data collection platform and Paolo is gonna go through the mobile research platform. Um, but the, the challenge, though, is that, you know, with the pandemic, labs just weren't being used. People didn't want to share equipment, putting them from one person to the next. And there was really this demand for, is there any way that we can collect data from people while they're in their own homes? And this is really where the online data collection module was born. So what this, um, what this allows you to do is use your webcam to actually collect eye tracking and facial expression data from people in their own homes. And you can actually design studies with images, videos, or websites, and actually upload them to the cloud and then actually distribute them online to different populations wherever you like. So what that gives you then is not only the safety of being able to collect remotely, but also really removing the bounds of geography and the logistics of having to physically bring people into a lab. For those that are doing university research, your participant pool is the student body at that university, right? It's a very restricted sample size. But what you can do with an online data collection module like this is be able to send your study to different states in the US. Or if you wanted to look at Western versus Eastern populations, you can send those studies online to people on either side. Um, so it really allows you to get a little bit more um, diversity in your population, um, which can lead to some interesting insights. So to this end, um, basically how this works is you would design a study, upload it to iMotion's cloud, and it'll give you sort of a URL that you can distribute either using a panel provider or your own email service. Um, you can actually monitor the state of data collection as it's happening, and then analyze within iMotion's to derive those similar measures like facial expression content, heat maps, and so on. So you might have noticed something different when I talk about ODC, and that is the use of our webcam-based eye tracking. And like I mentioned, if you're using eye tracking in a lab, that will basically involve <clears throat> a custom piece of hardware. So an actual eye tracker that you would stick onto the bottom of your monitor that is specially designed to track where people are looking on a screen. If you're collecting data remotely, obviously you can't use that little piece of hardware. You can't ship it to every participant out there. Um, so we've developed our own webcam-based eye tracking algorithm. So using a simple webcam, like the one built into your laptop or any sort of Logitech USB webcam you get off of Amazon, um, what we're able to do is record the face and actually record where the eyes are looking on the screen. 
and again, map where people are looking on your screen and again, derive some heat maps like this. So down below, we have a couple of examples of people looking at different rooms and seeing where do people focus on. We have this more minimalist room here on the right and then a slightly more rustic, more uh, heavily decorated room on the left. And you can see that there are some clear differences in where people tend to focus. Uh, on the minimalist room on the right with fewer features, people tend to focus more on specific elements than others. It's a lot less diffuse. Whereas uh, a more chaotic, more, a busier scene like this tends to draw attention all over the place. So you see a much more diverse heat map of visual attention um, spread across the entire image. Now, one of the caveats of using webcam based eye tracking is that we're actually using a computer algorithm to detect the eyes. And I have to sort of talk about this as a caveat whenever we do talk about webcam based eye tracking. Um, a lot of people get really focused on the convenience of it, but less so on sort of the technical caveats. Um, so when you are using webcam based eye tracking, we're using computer vision to actually look at the eyes. Uh, detect them in the face and then see where they're looking. And this is sort of an example of different eyes that we can see, you know, that the camera would see as we're um, doing the webcam based eye tracking. And you can see that there's a lot of different, you know, varying qualities of picture. So an eye like this up here in the top right will do really well with webcam based eye tracking, whereas this one down below on the bottom left, probably not so much. Um, so what you're going to get then is a trade off between the convenience of using webcam based eye tracking with sort of the kind of accuracy and yield that you're going to get. Um, typically, if normal eye tracking is up here with high accuracy and high yield, so you're all of your participants yielding some sort of good data, webcam eye tracking will usually have less accuracy and less yield. And you have to account for that in the kinds of designs that you're going to be running. Now, what can affect webcam based eye tracking? There's a lot of different factors here. Um, we can look at uh, sort of bad lighting conditions, upload issues, video encoding issues, and so on. All of this basically means is that because there's more moving parts in deploying a study remotely, you do have to account for that with a larger sample size. So if, you know, for any sort of lab study where we have eye tracking and facial expressions, we recommend sort of a sample size of 30. Typically, if we're doing it online, we would recommend doubling or even tripling that sample size. Um, so you just have to be mindful of that if you do decide to use remote tools. But to assure sort of the best kind of quality, if you are collecting data from people's homes, um, some factors can really come into play here. So having really good lighting conditions in a person's home, um, making sure people are seated in front of a camera head on and, and nicely, um, and that you know they're actually following instructions, not moving. Uh, one of the things that I noticed collecting data remotely is that you'll get a lot of people on the couch with the laptop on their knees, probably not the ideal sort of uh, scenario for collecting data. People are eating, you know, some people have their shirts off, that makes it kind of weird. So, so being able to give good instructions and assure good compliance from, uh, from your participant population is really important when you're collecting studies on such a broad level like this. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to Paolo to talk about our mobile research platform where you can actually collect data out in the wild. Yes, thank you, Jessica. And um, yes, I will just ask you to move forward the slides. Perfect. So um, yeah, what you what we talked so far about, uh, what Jessica showed you, were our solutions for research in the lab and then online uh, data collection, so with a web browser. And what I'm going to cover now is a slightly different approach that is to use a smartphone to collect data and this way move your lab outside. <laughs> so really not uh, be limited to any, any specific location for uh, your studies, for your data collection, but just allow your participants to, to move around in, uh, in their space and collect data for longer periods of time and still have data then uploaded and synchronized to the cloud. And uh, the um, yeah, for one of the reasons or some of the reasons we decided to work on this uh, platform for mobile research is really that uh, we want to make it possible to collect data uh, using uh, mobile devices and still keep the multimodal approach that we have uh, across the board. And that it means that you can connect several uh, sensors and collect data from various sources at the same time. 
and uh, that can be done in a modular fashion so that you can tailor your your uh, your study setup to the specific research question you want to answer but um, let's move forward to the next slide thank you um, this is the way we approach this problem of uh, mo mobile research and that is based uh, on a cloud platform um, in that is uh, here represented in the middle that is used both by the researchers to set up a study and then monitor the ongoing study and uh, is used by the, the participants they interact with the study using their smartphone and the smartphone runs an app that can connect to the different sensors that are being used and also provides interaction in the study and that might sound a bit abstract now but i'm going to show a few examples in a minute uh, of use cases that you can uh, cover using this uh, this technology so these are actually some examples of the sensors that you can use in this kind of research and keep in mind that the focus here is really a study where your participants are moving out of about uh, about maybe they are if they're tourists uh, if that's your uh, if that's the focus of your research you could recruit participants among actual tourists at a given location provide them with the with the hardware and then let them explore the location and collect data at the same time and so things that can be relevant here could for instance be among the internal phone sensors things like a step counter so that can give you a measure of how much people are walking how fast they're walking so the distance is they're covering and uh, that can be paired also with location tracking either based on gps or on uh, uh, beacons uh, if the focus is an indoor indoor location tracking and then of course that is uh, often paired with wearable sensors so it, that is to add the physiological aspect to the to the study and to the data collection so you could, for instance, collect uh, heart rate data with, a, with various heart rate monitors that can be connected to a smartphone. You could use eye tracking, uh, and in particular, eye tracking glasses. So that's um, like in some of the examples that uh, Jessica showed you before, and smartwatches of different types. And then all the sensing aspect uh, is, is paired with self-reporting. And I think that's uh, a key factor here because the as we also saw in uh, in the example by Nielsen that was mentioned before by Jessica, we really observe that sensors uh, and uh, biometrics combined with self-reporting is often um, a very good way to run a study because it provides a combination of objective data that is collected using the sensors and something that the participants are reporting themselves using questionnaires or surveys or other types of self-reporting that can be built into your study. We can move to the next. Yes. And one way of doing that, uh, so combining the uh, sensor data with the self-reporting, is using what we call the trigger task logic. So you can set various conditions that could be time of the day, that could be based on location, could also be based on some of the sensor data that you're collecting. And once the condition you define is verified, then you can send a notification to your participants on the phone that they're using to participate in the study. And uh, that could include a survey if you want to ask them a question that is based on the context, uh, based on the, on the specific situation they are in at the moment, or could be a task. For instance, that could be find a specific landmark in the area if you want to verify how easy it is to navigate a location and so on. So that also adds both interactivity in your uh, mobile study and also contextual information. And speaking about context, um, I think that's a, a point that is uh, important to, to uh, talk about a little, bit, a little bit more. Look at this example. So here, the timeline is actually in hours so you're looking at more than 12 hours worth of the heart rate data that we collected uh, using a wearable sensor so how to interpret that well that's a really difficult task because you if you just look at the signal as it is you have no context at all so when you see an elevated heart rate value you don't know if that's because your participant is maybe feeling stressed 
or uh, agitated for some reason, or maybe they're just running to catch a bus. So trying to have context added to your data is very important. So if we go one slide forward, yes. That's an example of context. So that's something that you can add in various ways to your data and really helps with interpretation. So here, the context is uh, given by this annotation that tell you about the activity or the, the location where your participant was at various times. So we can see that some of the lower values of, of uh, heart rate were associated with just sitting still in, uh, in the office uh, at work, and then higher heart rate during the commute, exercising, again, lower heart rate when, when they were at home, and then sleep, and so on. So that's um, something that really helps in the interpretation and the analysis of data that you collect. And if we go on slide, yes. Um, yeah, the, at the top I have this quote that is, uh, yeah, it's maybe a bit uh, depressing the first time you look at it, but on the other hand, it should be used as a, an indication, as a, a reminder that you should always make sure that you have the right tools to interpret the data that you're collecting. And uh, to add this context to your data, you could, for instance, if we're talking about mobile research, one way would be to collect location data together with the wearable, uh, wear, wearable sensors. And location can, in, as an example before, tell you where the participant was and therefore help with interpretation of the data. Context would also be video or pictures. So it's um, if it was a study with eye tracking glasses, there naturally you would have a video from the participant's point of view that would help with interpreting the data. Otherwise, you could use other types of cameras uh, or um, uh, to to add some video and visual data to your signals. And finally, self-reporting and questionnaires. You could also just simply uh, every. Once in a while, ask your participants where they are, if they are at work, if they are at home, if they are exercising. And again, that would be another way to add context. So that's something really to keep in mind when you are designing a study that is, especially for a mobile study that is out of the, outside of the lab. And uh, finally, one remark is that multimodality, which is really the, I think the point that both Jesse and I are trying to, to um, hammer home, is that uh, multimodality is something that helps you add context because you're collecting data from several sensors, several devices, maybe combined with self-reporting, and that really makes it easier to interpret and then to uh, analyze the data that you collected. So next, I wanted to say a bit more about uh, the specific types of sensors that we can use in mobile research and uh, share a bit about the, yeah, what, we, what we feel are the most suited for various applications. So I mentioned briefly before the step counter, and that's often paired with an accelerometer. And so these are uh, sensors that are usually embedded in the smartphones. So you don't need any external hardware to collect these data. And can be very helpful if you want to run a data collection for over a long period of time where your participants are moving around, maybe they're walking in an environment. And uh, this way you can know how far they're walking, how fast they're going. And, and if you want to do something more precise, you could just look at the raw accelerometer data and get even more granular information. For instance, be able to discriminate whether they are, they are walking or maybe running, cycling, or maybe in, in transit and sitting on, on a train or a bus. So lightweight sensor that is, as I said, it's uh, already embedded in uh, most smartphones. So it's usually very helpful for many uh, mobile study designs. Next slide, please. Location tracking. Yes, so that I mentioned that before as a contextual information, but in fact, it can also just be the main sensor that you might want to use in a specific study. So we all know GPS. So that's the way to collect the location data when the participants are, are outdoors. If you're inside a building instead, uh, GPS is usually not the right choice because you don't get signal. On the other hand, you can use other indoor location tracking systems. And one of them uh, is uh, location beacons, which can tell the proximity of the 
device or the smartphone that a participant is uh, carrying to, to the beacon that is placed in a specific location. So if you, you could imagine, for instance, an indoor attraction, a museum, and you can place different beacons in uh, different rooms in the museum, and then be, this way be able to track when the participants are in each of the rooms. In the example here, uh, sorry, I just want to say a few more words about this. Uh, here you can see the route that the participant was uh, moving along, and that's paired with the heart rate value at that location. So um, that's also one way to, to visualize multimodal data, the heart rate combined with the, with the location. And then in, in this case, you can see which areas along the path are associated with an elevated heart rate. And that again can be used to either infer something about the location or perhaps about the movement of the participant if they were uh, running faster and that thereby getting elevated heart rate. Next slide, please. And um, yes, uh, again, about uh, heart rate. I just wanted to mention how, basically how good of a choice in many cases it is, um, if you want to run an experiment outside of the lab. So uh, one reason why I really like heart rate monitors is that they provide a quite robust signal and you can find them in various uh, form factors. So you can have chest straps like the, the Polar H10 that we show here at the top of the slide, or uh, the other ones are arm based, either wristbands or arm bands. And either way, it, they provide a signal that's quite robust. It works even when the participants are moving around. It's very easy to set up. Typically, these devices are developed for, initially were developed for, uh, for sports. So they are quite, uh, yeah, quite robust and, and, uh, and easy to set up. And in, um, the, the chest straps are based on uh, ECG, so the uh, electrocardiography. So they have a different technology than the arm-based ones that instead use light, um, light diet and the PPG for, uh, uh, to measure the heart rate. But either one can be a way to monitor the heart and the data you collect can then be used for analysis such as heart rate variability which in turn can provide insights about stress and fatigue and again, help you better understand the physiological processes that were happening at, with your participants at a given time. Next slide, please. And um, yeah, so here just briefly, uh, I wanted to give you a visual impression of how iMotion can support this kind of mobile research. These are a few screens from our mobile app where that you can use to run studies, such as the ones that we uh, that I talked about just now, connecting various sensors. And at the same time, as you can see in the screen in the middle, the app can be used to send out notifications to the participants, in this case, a survey task. And the participants can take the task on the force on the phone itself, and this way provide self-reported data for your study. And so again, all of what we were saying about contextual information. Next slide, please. Yes, and now I just wanted to walk you through a couple of use cases that we have uh, developed using these technologies. So yes, the first one is uh, what we call the location heat map. So the, what you see on the screen is a map of a part of Copenhagen and uh, you see with a red line, I highlighted one of the main landmarks here for tourists, everybody who visits Copenhagen the first time has to go and see the Little Mermaid. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to see how one could uh, try to track and visualize the movements of visitors in this area. So you can see there are there is this attraction and in the middle there is this sort of park where people can walk through. And on the left side of the screen, there is a train station, which is the nearest train station to, to this, uh, to the Little Mermaid. So uh, next slide. So the way to do that um, in this example was to use the GPS tracking on the participants' phones. And so this way we can record their location over time. And uh, then uh, once we collect data from a number of people, then we can find a way to aggregate. And that's the visualization that you have here. 
In fact, we talked before with Jessica about uh, heat maps for visual attention. And this is a different kind of heat map because instead it shows the location, so an aggregated view of the location data. And where you have green color, it means that there was some, um, some people walked uh, or where in the vicinity of that for some time. And when it gets yellow and, and red, that means that more people were standing at that location for a longer period of time. So if you did that over a city and you had your participants explore, you would be able to get a visual impression of which areas are hotspots. And, uh, and then, of course, you could dig down and, uh, into the data and uh, look more into details and, for instance, see what the paths that various participants took were. And then of course, since we always want to combine the sensor data with some self-reporting and contextual information, another thing that you could do here is to define uh, an active area, again, using GPS uh, location tracking, to build a trigger that shows, that notifies and shows the service to the visitors when they are in that area. So again, as an example, when they are in the vicinity of the Little Mermaid, then you could send out a survey question asking something about that specific location. And I think another advantage here, um, and I haven't mentioned that before, is that you get to ask your survey question precisely at the time when the interaction happens. So in this case, precisely when they are close to the Little Mermaid. And so this way you can try to better capture the immediate reaction and impression that the participants had of the location as opposed to sending a survey maybe at the end of the day or a week after when people would have to sit down and try to remember what was, uh, what was going on. Yeah, and the second one is a, an example that we, yeah, for data collection that we run here in Copenhagen and it combines eye tracking glasses with wearable sensors. And uh, yeah, there is a little video that we can try to play. So it's a uh, so it's it's similar to what uh, Jessica was showing before in a, in the museum context. Just that here we're not limited by any specific location because the eye tracking glasses and the other sensors are connected to a smartphone. So in this case, our participant is riding a bicycle through Copenhagen. They have the eye tracking glasses on, so we can see the gaze where they were looking at over time. And if you look in the signals at the bottom, maybe it's it's a bit small. But you can see the first three lines, they are based on the GPS signal. So they tell you the coordinates and then the speed measure, uh, you infer from GPS. And the line, the graph at the bottom is uh, actually the heart rate. So again, uh, we can combine the uh, physiological signal recorded with a, with a wearable heart rate monitor with the contextual information, in this case, both the GPS coordinates and the uh, video coming from the eye tracking glasses. So again, another type of study that perhaps can support types of research that, are, that also have a qualitative part to them, where you could uh, rewatch the, the video, the actual video of, what, of how a participant experienced a certain uh, location. Yes. Yeah, I think we can probably move on. Yeah, uh, thank you, Paolo. So with yeah. that, uh, we're, we'll just sort of wrap it up here, but just in summary, um, to go over what we covered over the past hour, just looking at the idea of emotion and attention and how they are factors in the tourism industry across all the different stages of planning, execution, and evaluation in the moment. Um, emotion and attention are, you know, instead of being nebulous cognitive concepts, they can be measured through a combination of biosensor tools and self-report, whether it's surveys done afterward or, as Paolo just demonstrated, um, surveys done in the moment. Research can be screen-based or done in live environments, but with the advent of sort of these new tools that have developed in part due to the pandemic, but just also the you know, desire to just collect more and more data in more naturalistic settings, either online within people's own homes or using mobile integrations like the mobile research platform, we can get at a sense of how people are reacting, feeling in the moment um, as they're going through an experience live and really opens up some new vistas uh, in this kind of research. So 
All of that to sort of summarize, um, at the end of the day, you know, we are iMotions, we are a software platform that allows all this stuff to happen. Um, we also uh, resell the biosensors and hardware, so all the tools that you saw previewed here. Uh, and then the third bucket that we really like to hang our hat on is our support and services. So consultations with researchers, um, training, education. Uh, we really try to sink a lot of resources into that, especially for those uh, for whom these technologies are new and they're really curious uh, and want to get into it. We've been powering uh, academic labs and commercial labs all across the world. Um, so we cater to both academia and industry. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more, if you would like a free consultation, you can always email marketing at iMotions.com. We'll be happy to sit down and see the kind of work that you're doing and how we can best fit in. Um, if you're interested in some of the publications in tourism that do feature iMotions, um, you can head to iMotions.com slash publications and search in the tourism industry. Um, this one's my favorite. It's actually a paper from 2018 looking at uh, hospital service robots and how people perceive and interact with uh, different prototypes of them um, with some eye tracking and GSR, which is really cool. And then if you really decide this is definitely for me and I want to just go you know, head first into it, we also have our iMotions Academy. That's a week-long biosensor boot camp where you and um, a bunch of other people, it's like a nice little tight-knit uh, intensive where you really get your hands dirty with the sensors, um, meet with the team, and, uh, and do your first pilot study. So with that, we will stop here and thank you everyone for listening and we'll be happy to field questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you so much, Paolo. Indeed, fantastically interested, interesting, uh, insightful, and basically that's, that's the future of tourist experience, isn't it? Because we've been indeed trying to learn and search for ways to improve tourist experience by asking, by talking, but people forget, people uh, change their opinion, people hide, people don't want to lie or to say truth sometimes because they want to be too, too polite without sharing what they really felt. And then in the end, they forget. So indeed, that kind of research is the future of, of tourism. And I'm happy that we, we actually have lots of questions already. Um, so, um, I can read in the comments that, uh, actually there are people who already use su such solutions among our guests and that's fantastic, I, I, I believe. And the first question <coughs> is basically, um, about the application. So, um, have you used these methods to study, uh, the appeal of natural environment? Mm. really outside and virtual nature environment. Yeah, that, that, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think it, it sort of depends on the angle that you want to go for. I think um, sort of the restorative quality of natural environments I know is something that people are interested in. And I've actually um, seen some research groups that are interested in, especially in like healing settings like hospitals, introducing more natural environments in there. And then how does that sort of affect the restorative nature of the space, right? Um, so there's a couple tools that we could look at. Um, GSR, so like skin conductance, just to get at sort of a, a level of you know, physiological arousal in the moment. So, you know, if you were to be in a, in a really intense space, that would go up, but in a restorative space, you would see that go down over time. Um, one that we touched on, or that we didn't touch on too much was heart rate and heart rate variability. And I think that would be a really good option in this space. So HRV basically looks at um, sort of the interaction of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems on the heart. And it, in a sense, it gets at emotional flexibility in a way. So if you're in a space where you're depressed, bipolar, bereaved, very stressed out situations, your heart rate variability is actually very low. So your heartbeat is like a metronome, it's just on time all the time. Um, but in sort of more restorative scenarios, um, then you get a little bit more variability in your heartbeat. So a beat will get thrown out here, thrown out there, and you see sort of the variability increase and that value go up. So if you wanted to look at sort of the emotional restorative nature of natural spaces compared to some sort of other controlled environment, um, I think HRV and GSR would definitely be your best bet there. And I can also chime in here. Um, in fact, we just recently um, helped researchers uh, who were working on a 
project along these lines. And their focus was exactly to look at how a natural environment or maybe the simulation of a natural environment could help relieve stress. And it was in a, in a workplace context. And what they used there uh, using our uh, mobile uh, app was in fact uh, heart rate monitors to measure heart rate variability. And again, it was paired with, uh, with surveys that were, uh, that were shown to the participants when they were in the, in the area with the, with the simulated uh, natural, natural environment. And uh, right now they are looking at the data that uh, that was collected. But yes, I, I agree with Jessica. Uh, heart rate and heart rate variability would be very good, uh, very good tools to use for this kind of research. Thank you. And uh, to, to continue the question from Lisa, um, you, I, I personally know because I work with your solutions as well that you have virtual reality. Uh, setups with eye tracking. What would you suggest, for example, for studying uh, nature-based tourism? For example, tourist experience, hikers, mountain experience, lake experience. Would how would you design such a study? Would you consider uh, external measurement in the real environment, or would you consider simulating it with virtual reality? Yeah, let's see. It really sort of, it really depends on the kind of question that you want to answer. And I think these sensors always work when you're comparing them to a reference, right? So if you wanted to sort of look at, you know, the, if you wanted to look at whether a virtual naturalistic experience was really comparable to sort of the real thing, then you could have, you know, have your virtual setup that you could have, you could have like a 360 video of actually going through the space or some photogrammetry to really make it as authentic as possible and immersive um, and have people go through the virtual environment versus having them go through the physical environment. And obviously there's gonna be factors between the two of them that are different, you know, the, the quality of the air that you're breathing, having to actually step over obstacles and so on that are also going to affect your experience. So I think, you know, getting at sort of the validity of those naturalistic environments as a reasonable proxy for the real thing, I think is always going to be a good first step. And then once you've sort of, you know, established sort of some commonality between the virtual and, and the real environments, then you can sort of, you know, dig a little bit deeper into the virtual one and how that can be used in a more extensive setting. Um, Paolo, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I definitely um, agree with uh, what you were saying, Jessica. And... Yeah, I think another key thing to keep in mind, and uh, uh, that's something that I often recommend to, to researchers, if you want to do research in the wild uh, using the mobile platform or in general wearables, I think it's usually always good to try to limit as much as possible the number of uh, sensors and different devices that you need to use. It can be tempting to say, let's collect as much data as we can, but then what ends up happening is that uh, the participants will get overwhelmed and you will end up not getting any good data. So it's always good to start small, select a few sensors that are robust enough, that are designed for use, the use outside of the lab, and just start from, from that and see what, uh, what insights you can get from, from data. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for the insights. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. Uh, First of all, there are some methodological questions as well, but related to facial expression analysis. So uh, you do the analysis based on a really uh, huge sample of recorded emotions, uh, but still, how do you handle different cultures and different ethnicities? So uh, Maximilian uh, asks, for example, if you work with different people, let's say from Asia, from different societies and cultures, uh, a smile in a Vietnamese context might mean that people are shy or uncomfortable. That's why they smile. Or I, I used to live, <clears throat> sorry, in Hong Kong myself, and uh, they tend to have blank face. So how do you handle these differences? Yeah, no, that's that's a question we we get a lot, and there's sort of there's two directions we can take with it. So the first is definitely there are cultural differences in how people convey emotion, and that's really sort of something you have to keep in mind with facial expression analysis is that you really are only getting at what's visible, uh, and we know that you know there are some cultures that are very expressive, 
Um, and we see that with actors that can emote outwardly without necessarily feeling it internally. And then also there are cultures that can be very stoic in their countenance, but can still feel everything internally, right? Um, so that is that is something that you have to keep in mind when designing your study and interpreting your results is those cultural differences, especially if you're working with a certain population. But this is also the benefit of having a multimodal um, sort of uh, setup here because skin conductance can get at that internal physiological condition, and that's not something you can control consciously. I'm not going to sit here and think I'm going to not sweat in response to this, right? Whereas facial expressions you can easily control. So having additional sensors in there can help fill in those gaps a little bit. Now, the other angle of it is sort of this, this interesting comment in the question about you know, Vietnamese people may laugh when feeling uncomfortable, for example, and that's really sort of a context dependent way of showing expression. Different engines try to get around it. Um, for Affectiva, which is the engine that we talked about as sort of our main um, offering here, they're based off of the facial action coding system, which is sort of your academic standard for qualifying facial expressions. And it's really, you know, an objective measure as just what ex what facial expressions or movements are they making, and they try to remove the context from that as much as possible. So for some people that might work because it is sort of an academic standard, it's been in the literature for a while, and that's like sort of a validated method. Um, there's another engine out there called Realize, which we also work with, that's designed for market research applications. They go about it in a different way where their training data is actually um, evaluated by crowdsourcing. So if you were to have um, a bunch of training data of Vietnamese people laughing in response to an ad, that's actually evaluated locally by Vietnamese coders who say, oh, this person looks happy or no, they're actually really uncomfortable. And, and, and that is how Realize tries to sort of get around those cultural differences. So that's something that they pay a little bit more attention to. Um, so it can sort of also depend on the kind of tool that you want to use and again, sort of the angle that you want to take, but I, that's always like a really interesting question and it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, I have a quick question regarding this topic. So when, when you say that, uh, basically we can, uh, we can go around these, these cultural differences, could you think that maybe by analyzing the GSR data, uh, we can basically comprehend whether a facial expression is indeed uh, happiness or in other way it could be feeling uncomfortable? Yeah, um, GSR is a little bit tough for that because it just gives you arousal or like a physiological intensity to something and you can get that looking at a baby and you can get that looking at a tiger like it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative you're still going to get that high arousal response so gsr is really tough to give you that um eeg might actually be a good measure if you want to dig into that because that's where that sort of approach avoidance withdrawal comes from um so if I were to see something that, you know, elicits happiness and makes me laugh, I'll probably have a greater approach motivation towards it. Whereas if I have that, like, I'm very uncomfortable and I want to extricate myself from this sort of, uh, it, sort of sentiment, even if I am smiling outwardly, you might actually see that sort of avoidance uh, motivation reflected in the EEG. So that could be another tool that you could bring in to dig a little bit more into that dynamic. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, it 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 is make it makes perfect sense. And, and uh, we have time for a few more questions. And that's one of the most painful one, I guess, especially for for European context. So how about GDPR? What do we do? <laughs> Paolo, being in Copenhagen, do you want to address this one first? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, of course, uh, yeah, GDPR set uh, a quite strict set of requirements on the the way to do research for uh, at least for EU-based researchers. Mm, but we see that really as, uh, well, in a way it is a challenge. Uh, we can't uh, really not say that, but at, at the same time, it makes us improve the quality of our work and our software. And I think that the same applies to all researchers. So I think basically the message there is that we need to be super open about what data we are collecting why we're collecting these data. And then of course, make sure that it's possible for the participants to give an informed consent. And then afterwards, if they decide that they change their mind to have their data removed afterwards. And uh, we were 
lucky enough that all these uh, principles and considerations were already present when we started working on our mobile platform. And uh, because of that, we have built those into, into the system. So when you invite your participants, they give consent to the study, and then they, they join the study with their own credentials. So they get a username and password to log in onto the phone. So that ensures that the data that, they, that is collected on the phone is, is uh, uh, associated with a specific person that is, that, is, uh, been, that is participating in the study. And then afterwards, once the data is stored, it's encrypted on the server, and uh, it's uh, um, done in a way that data and uh, all the personal information are kept separate. So I would say that's in, a, in the sense of uh, architecture of the platform, that as much as we can do to make it easy for researchers to be GDPR compliant when they use our solutions. Then, of course, there are types of data that inherently are contain personal information. And let's think about GPS, for instance. You can uh, remove all the uh, names and uh, email addresses from your uh, database. But if you're collecting GPS over several days, you will end up realizing where the person lives. So you have their address. So that's not great in terms of, uh, of uh, data protection. But what we can do there is then find specific ways to handle these data that contain personal information. And for GPS, that could be adding some, uh, some noise to the data. That's one technique that is used. So you will, uh, instead of recording the precise coordinates that come from the, from the sensor, you will add some, some noise or you will remove some precision. So maybe you will be able to see which neighborhood the person lives at, but not the specific address. And so this way, make the data, anonymize the data. And then the correct way of uh, handling this will be dependent on, this, on the context, whether you're collecting data on, uh, on uh, healthy volunteers, or if it's in the context of healthcare research, if it's patients, and so they are thereby more protected by regulations. But I think all of that can be accommodated. The thing is that as a researcher, you need to think about GDPR and data production upfront at the beginning when you start designing your study. And this way, you make it easy for yourself later when you're ready to, to run the study to make sure that everything is compliant with the, with the regulations. So it's more of a process than just a switch that you turn on or off. Yeah, thank you. And uh, well, one more question, which is a little bit different, but also kind of really important. Have you ever tried to engage real tourists? So. Uh, Lots of studies have been done actually in, in laboratories or when people, participants are invited to participate to complete some tasks. Uh, have you ever tried, let's say, to, to go to a location, maybe in tourism, maybe in real shopping environment, just to stop people and try to engage them into such kind of study? Is it possible? I've seen it a lot in the sort of consumer insights like marketing space where, you know, if we're looking at storefronts, for example, and you have sort of a new thing and you want to see how people are traversing a grocery store, I've absolutely seen groups just recruit people off the street and they'll have sort of a mobile lab outside where they put all the stuff on you and then they just send you in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of the eye tracking glasses to their credit have become a lot more um, a lot less conspicuous in letting people know that there's like actually a sensor on your face. They just look like actual glasses. So they look, they're a little bit more natural looking. Within the tourism industry, I've not seen it all that much. And I think it's because um, of a couple things. One, just sort of the state of the technology, uh, like being able to collect data remotely like this is still very new. Um, and we see it a lot more in academic research and it hasn't necessarily bled over into industry applications just yet. Um, the second is just sort of the, you know, the considerations with, uh, again, just privacy, GDPR, all those sorts of things. And it, it's just sort of, you know, there's going to be a lot of red tape and logistics to go through before something like this would actually be available. Uh, and, you know, if you were to have sort of a simple form factor, like a bracelet or something that like a hotel chain could put on people, I mean, there's, there's a lot of sort of 
um, you know, legal and privacy considerations they have to go through to think about that, right? So I think for the time being, you know, doing it within the constraints of research is, you know, people are doing that right now. And I think that's sort of the easiest to implement within a controlled scenario because there's, you know, ethics committees and so on that can sort of keep it constrained. Um, it'll be interesting as the technology evolves and things become more portable, less obvious, um, how this will actually manifest in an industrial setting. Um, yeah, we just need to see where it goes. That's indeed really, really interesting. Thank you so much for a really insightful presentation. I see that there are some questions more and more coming about personal data, about GDPR and how to handle this research. Uh, but we are slowly running out of time. So I would really encourage everyone to get in touch with emotions because they have fantastic database knowledge base about how to do that. Um, also, I would like to invite you to, to, to stay in touch till the evening. So in about one hour, I will try to catch up. So Jessica and Paolo shared fantastic overview of what is possible now. The future is now already. So uh, in, in about one hour, we'll also have a, uh, a small workshop showing these data in more details. So how exactly the data of facial expression analysis might look like, how exactly the GSR data might look like, and how you can start interpreting it uh, in tourism contexts, how people reacted uh, and how you can get inferences out of that. So those who are interested, you are more than welcome uh, to continue this topic in about an hour, also based on the platform of iMotions. But at this point, I would like to thank the team of Jessica and Paolo for, for coming. Thank you very much for dedicating your time. Um, if you, well, don't mind, uh, we will share the video of your um, workshop with our uh guests and of course with you as well um and uh yeah i'm looking forward for further collaboration and further innovations from your side thank, thank you, you so much so katarina thank you thank you everyone thank you so much and at this point um i would like to pass uh the floor to my colleague julia zwillig who will uh introduce you to our next guest so, Julia, please, the Hello. floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Katerina. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Julia, and I will be with you till the rest of uh, this vlog. Um, and I'm happy to welcome and introduce the next uh, keynote speaker, uh, Raya Kompola. I'm sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly. <laughs> um, so, professor of marketing, especially tourism business, at the University of Eastern Finland Business School. Um, and we are looking forward to the presentation uh, on the topic initiatives promoting development of the nature-based services and experiences, uh, evidence from Finland. Uh, so uh, I would like to remind you that after the presentation, we will have uh, an, op an opportunity to ask the questions. And also you can uh, already during the presentation post your questions to the chat and then after the presentation, <coughs> I will announce all of them. Uh, so, uh, Professor Kapula, you're welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julia, and uh, I'm, I'm very honored to, to be able to, to give this uh, short uh, presentation. It has been an absolutely wonderful day. Uh, so interesting, interesting presentations. And um, let's see if I will be able to, to share my screen. So hopefully, 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 oops. Uh, this is always the most uh, difficult part of the, the. Uh, yes, but now can we can you see. see? We oh, can see it it's perfectly not, well. It's not from the beginning, sorry. Yeah. Here, is this the first one? 
Perfect. Yeah. Okay. With the title. Thank you very much. So uh, <clears throat> my presentation will be very much uh, continuation to my colleague, uh, Finnish colleague Lisa Durvainen's presentation, where she was uh, talking about the um, uh, current uh, research evidence about the the uh, health um, uh, positive health uh, benefits of uh, nature-based tourism, and I will be talking. Um, uh, I will be giving you some examples, but uh, first, just to to say a few words about the starting point for this presentation. So um, there is, as we have heard already today, um, there are lots of evidence of the positive health benefits of the nature. Uh, but then there are also some evidence, um, uh, research evidence of the linkages uh, between the leisure experience and uh, the uh, Japanese words ikigai, which refers to life worthiness. And both of these uh, somehow are related to, to the word of subjective well-being, which I will be talking um, a little bit um, in this presentation as well. But um, <clears throat> um, an interesting question is that even though uh, we, we may have uh, parks in the cities and people may, may live close, close to forests or close to, to water environments, still um, there is a question if if the nature really is accessible for all, uh, not only referring to, to any kind of disabili disabilities, but, but um, in, in general. And uh, what, what I'm, I'm going to talk um, today uh, now is about how the active nature experiences or uh, um, active outdoor activities in the nature can be seen as um, some kind of means of um, enhancing not only the health but also the subjective well-being and particularly the experience of inclusion, particularly among uh, the disadvantaged people, not only disabled uh, related to the accessibility but but somehow vulnerable um, uh, groups of people in, in the society. And this is somehow uh, related to those topics that, that we are doing research at our university, um, um, at the um, East, University of Eastern Finland Business School at the moment. So um, uh, in my presentation, I will first um, shortly um, um, explain what, what we mean about these uh, two concepts, meaning subjective well-being and experience of inclusion. And then I will give a few uh, examples of uh, initiatives um, that, that might, might be related to enhancing, enhancing um, particularly this experience in, in inclusion and uh, in, in this nature-based uh, environment and then shortly some discussion about uh, current research and then some um, uh, words about uh, what kind of research might be needed uh, around this topic. So uh, um, uh, these uh, concepts um, subjective well-being and experience of inclusion um, they, they are quite familiar in, in tourism research. Um, uh, we have um, lots of uh, studies uh, uh, related to happiness, um, quality of life, um, somehow related to uh, positive psych psychology, which um, have used this, uh, this concept of subjective well-being and um, this, uh, this uh, concept refers to all aspects of a person and 
also in our studies also all aspects of a family's life, uh, including um, overall life satisfaction, physical and psychological health and well-being, social and financial um, well-being, family and uh, friend uh, relationships, uh, work and leisure, and so forth. And um, then we also have um, another concept um, called experience of inclusion, which is uh, probably more uh, common and, and more <clears throat> familiar uh, from um, social sciences uh, and, and related to social work and that, that kind of research. And um, this, um, this concept, experience of inclusion, Oh, I have a mistake here. It should be E I <laughs> E O uh, I indicates the the subjective experience of being a meaningful part of some good group or a community, meaning like a meaningful part of a family or a a class in in at school or or a um, group of uh, people um, uh, um, like, like doing a hobby or association or, or, or any, any kind of a community group. And um, these uh, elements like self-confidence, meaningfulness of life, social belongingness, and, and um, feelings of control of, of one's life, they, they, they both uh, are related to, to these both concepts. And um, um, a um, researcher in, in my research group, uh, El Livento, who has been doing research, uh, particularly in the context of social tourism, she has uh, uh, used uh, this, uh, these two concepts in her studies and, and she has realized that, that these, these uh, concepts are very much overlapping. That when we look, for example, the, the um, uh, European Social Survey, which uh, is related to um, personal and social well-being, and then on the other hand, if we look at the National Institute for Health and Welfare in Finland and, and their studies about experience of in inclusion. Um, and then uh, some, some other studies, uh, these, these have some kind of a common spot here, uh, referring to, to um, aspects that, that are very much uh, related to, to all those, um, all those uh, feelings uh, that that relate to the well-being and and at the same time to how how an uh, individual uh, feels uh, in, in included in in the society or in the community and uh, <clears throat> so um, as i said uh, we have been doing research on on social tourism and in finland uh, the the concept of social tourism and the practice of social tourism is, is most often um, very much uh, practiced in, in uh, facilities and environments which are most um, more, more or less nature-based. And um, uh, just to define uh, shortly what social tourism is, if, if uh, any of you wouldn't have heard about that. Social tourism is something um, relates to, to activities of, um, in some countries, activities of governments uh, and local authorities, like in, in um, France, for example, or in Finland, uh, or charities like in, in uh, UK, and or other kinds of organizations uh, which um, are aiming to support opportunities for disadvantaged people to have a holiday away from home. Meaning that um, the social tourism uh, initiative uh, promotes equality. And the starting points, point is that 
every person has a right uh, for a holiday away from home. And, and that is some kind of a social right. And, um, and um, uh, that is the reason why, why in several countries, uh, this um, uh, initiative um, have different kinds of uh, systems which uh, offer uh, subsidized holidays to families with children, like in United uh, UK, there is the Family Holidays Association, a charity which uh, supports um, single mothers and, and families with children uh, by different kinds of, uh, of supports, uh, support to, to enable them to take a holiday away from home. In Finland, um, the social tourism is, is a very uh, well-established uh, and uh, has long tradition and uh, in Finland we have uh, five uh, publicly funded uh, associations that that offer a um, normally a one week subsidized holiday in in holiday resorts normally um, away from um, urban um, environments and for example here in North Karelia and, and eastern part of Finland where, where we operate we have several uh, holiday resorts which are specialized in, in social tourism and all of them are located in, in rural areas and, and, and very close to the nature. And um, this, um, this uh, funding means that basically uh, a family with children uh, normally only pays the, the travel costs and then uh, some hundred euro per an adult. So meaning that a, a one week holiday with uh, two adults and children might cost only the travel cost to the resorts plus 200 euro and it's full board uh, with uh, organized activities uh, for, for the family. And um, the, this, this is a, um, one, one of those initiatives, um, not only in Finland, but also in several other countries that, that, um, that is uh, targeted to, to um, disadvantaged uh, people to, to have an opportunity to, to enjoy nature and nature activities. Um, uh, during uh, their holiday. And um, this picture is um, uh, taken from uh, a uh, web page of the biggest holiday association uh, called uh, Wellbeing Holidays. Um, and uh, this somehow illustrates the, the joy of the family, um, the, the joy of, of the children when, when having access to, to, the, to the nature and, and to, to have an opportunity to spend time with the family in, in the nature uh, uh, all together doing, doing some nature-based activities. Um, we have conducted a few studies, the, the latest of them, uh, um, was published in Annals of Tourism uh, Research uh, last year. And um, in, in that uh, study, uh, we, we had a, um, a uh, quite a long, longitudinal uh, study uh, which, in which we, we um, had a survey for, um, for the holiday social holiday participants um, before the holiday, uh, measuring their um, well-being, and then after the holiday. And we also had a control group, which um, uh, did uh, respond to the survey before, before their, um, during, in the, at the time when they applied for the, for the holiday, 
and then uh, the uh, the control group uh, was formed uh, from those people who got a negative uh, decision meaning that they did not get the support uh, to the holiday and then afterwards they were they were uh, sent the, the similar kind of a, of a questionnaire in which they, um, uh, the uh, well-being was measured. And um, this, um, just to, to give a short um, conclusion about that study, we, we could conclu conclude that um, these um, effects of this nature-based social tourism holiday it had uh, positive effects on satisfaction with life, with satisfaction with leisure time, uh, health, health, mental health, um, family and social life. And also there were some positive um, um, effects on employment and economic situation, even though uh, the, the, uh, the holiday uh, actually did not have any, any um, actual um, uh, activities uh, towards that. But, but still um, the positive um, effects on, on also this, um, this inclusion, um, experience of inclusion was found. Then uh, an earlier research uh, in which we, we had a, uh, a, um, the, the study was um, a ethnographic study following, uh, following two different kind, kinds of, uh, of uh, social holiday tourist groups. Uh, and um, during that study, we could, we could see that, um, uh, that experiences of participation in, in uh, organized physical activities, for example, Nordic walk, walking in the nature, during the social holiday, they, they did motivate people to exercise more also after the holiday. holiday. So, so this, this kind of uh, activities, what they learned or what they got used to during the, their holiday, um, they, they somehow developed as a part of their, their uh, everyday life after the holiday as well. And, and one uh, very important notion um, also was that as, uh, as many social holiday participants live in, in cities and in urban environments where they don't have any, any kind of uh, direct connection to, to forests or lakes or uh, where the nature is not an everyday experience for them, for those, those people uh, experiencing and spending time and, and, and doing um, outdoor uh, activities um, in the nature during the holiday was a novel and, and a very uh, rare experience. And, and that was uh, the reason why it was very highly appreciated also. So um, we, uh, somehow see this uh, nature-based social tourism as, as, as one kind of a initiative to, to enhance the opportunities of uh, disadvantaged people to, to learn uh, something about uh, nature and, and to get uh, acquainted with nature and uh, nature activities. Then um, another example of um, this um, experience of in inclusion, um, uh, nature-based initiatives um, I'm, I'm presenting here is um, fishing, fishing as an activity. And um, fishing in its very simple form, like, like angling, the most simple form of angling, um, at least in Finland, it is free for free of charge, you don't need any kind of a, a permission um, if you're doing this, this um, simplest form of angling, and particularly the, the children under 18 uh, year or uh, elderly people uh, more than 65 years can, can do this um, fishing uh, for free. 
and also the um, gear for fishing is is very um, it, it doesn't uh, the cost is not not uh, remarkable so you can buy um, the gear for less than 10 euros or even less than than five euros so in that sense it's not a big issue and um, um, the next uh, slides uh, are from from a, uh, a publication of uh, Natural Research Institute Finland uh, called Wellbeing from Blue Spaces, Dreams in Research and Good Practices. And, and then we also, I, I also have some, some other slides here. But, but here we have, um, um, in, in this um, publication, we have several examples of different kinds of initiatives um, uh, by um, volunteers. Uh, meaning fishermen or fishing associations and, and also um, here um, concerning the Natural Resource Institute Finland. Um, for, for example, here we have in a fishing for uh, children, uh, some uh, a course, uh, fishing uh, lessons uh, by two professional fishing guides and they, they have been assisting um, school children how to fish and and um, and um, uh, they have uh, taught uh, also fish species and and how to to make food of fish and and how to how to pra practice this this hobby so um, then we also uh, have another example uh, taken from this uh, this publication um, where um, this initiative um, has been um, practiced with uh, long-term unemployed young men. And um, this, this was also about uh, uh, three hour lessons and, and, uh, and uh, this, this initiative uh, also was, was very uh, um, beneficial for for these these guys it it uh, did have an impact on their experience of inclusion and in their their um, it did activate them in in their everyday life um, the fishing initiative is is not only um, in Finland I, I have also an example uh, from uh, United Kingdom this this is the uh, web page um, from uh, Get Hooked on Fishing, uh, which is a charity um, also encouraging uh, children uh, to to these uh, outdoor activities and nature based uh, nature based hobbies, and that that will also be very good for their uh, life. And and this is also uh, from um, a, a uh, Finnish association, uh, F Fishermen's Association, which was also have this similar kind of initiatives, um, training uh, uh, children uh, to, to fish. And um, then one more um, initiative, uh, which, which we have in Finland, uh, uh, we have this uh, green care in in Finland, which is an uh, association working to to co coordinate, develop, and promote promote the use of nature, and um, particularly animal assisted assisted methods in combination with well-being and <clears throat> health services in Finland and. Uh, this uh, this initiative, um, uh, I, I think um, these are also somehow mentioned um, this because um, this association has uh, has been working a lot um, in um, in destinations um, everywhere in Finland, particularly here in the eastern and, and northern part of Finland, where where we have lots of uh, different kind of uh, 
tourism uh, development uh, programs. And um, in these, these uh, development programs, uh, uh, this uh, green care type of uh, services uh, in uh, which are related to, to how to utilize nature and how to utilize animal assisted methods um, to, to uh, enhance uh, the health and well-being of, of different kinds of uh, target groups. Um, this this um, green care brand uh, has, has uh, been um, uh, developed um, a lot. And at the moment, uh, I just had a look at the web page there are some almost 300 different kinds of product offerings, service offerings, very much of them related to, to this um, um, animal uh, assisted methods. And um, this uh, green care domain is somehow divided into, into this green care and green empowerment domain, which means that the green care refers to, to such um, um, initiatives where, where the uh, beneficiaries um, are somehow supported by social services of healthcare services so that they do not pay themselves. These, uh, these services, but there is some, some other kind of a um, social service, uh, for example, that, that may support the use of the services. And, and, and this is uh, comparable to, to these um, initiatives like farming for health or social farming or, or care farms in other countries. And at the same time, of course, those services uh, that are offered to these vulnerable um, uh, target groups uh, um, by, funded by, by social services, the same kind of services can be also offered to, to all people. Um, and uh, then in, in that sense, they, they might be more um, like wellness services if people are paying the, ser the services from their own pocket. But anyway, the idea is more or less the same um in in both uh, both uh, so the same service can be a great care or green empowerment service um so um somehow uh, we we have seen uh, in the in the earlier presentations by lisa and and also the other presentations that there is quite a lot of uh, research uh, in terms of measuring the, the health uh, benefits and the health effects. But if we look at the, <clears throat> the uh, experience of inclusion and, and more like this uh, social, um, social benefits um, of, uh, of nature, social benefits of, of nature-based tourism and not social benefits of, of, of uh, of any kind of nature-based services, um, there is not that much uh, research. Or then I was not—I have haven't been able to find find too much. Um, we have uh, referred in in our our studies to a few of them. There is uh, one, for example, from Johari Brown and Stoll. It's an ethnographic research with angling intervention programs working with this affected young people in the UK. This is a very in interesting, but, but that study doesn't uh, particularly focus on the experience of inclusion part, but, but somehow between the lines, one can read also um, findings that, that might be related to that. But, uh, but the study by Hurley and Walker, Walker from, from Canada, um, focusing on the impacts of uh, nature-based leisure among refugees in Canada, that, that's a very interesting study. 
um, they they had um, uh, a um, two day winter camp uh, uh, for um, uh, participants from from Africa and and Iran, and and in their study they could see that the nature and particularly the very very different uh, nature experience in the winterly winterly environment uh, was was really refreshing and, and interesting. Then we have some some Finnish evidence uh, um, uh, for Finnish children, young people, families engaged with nature. But also this doesn't um, uh, directly refer to, to this in, in experience of inclusion, inclusion part of the, um, the um, topic. So um, we are convinced that, uh, that in addition to the uh, direct uh, and indirect health um, um, benefits, uh, nature and nature experiences, particularly as, as a family unit or together with uh, parents and children, um, is, is something that, that we could uh, do more research on and, and also um, activating um, the um, disadvantaged youngsters to, to any kind of uh, nature-based activities um, might, might, might be a very good um, way to, to, um, to enhance their inclusion uh, in the society and uh, and um, enhance their their subjective well-being, but um, there are lots of initiatives I know in Finland, in in, in United Kingdom, everywhere. But um, much more research um, would be would be welcome, and and this is uh, what what we we will um, at our at our research group what we we would uh, be happy to 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 do more so um it's uh, for example these access accessibility issues um even though for example here in finland we we have the everyone's right and and everybody can go to to the forest and pick berries but but uh, the point is that that if you're if you're living in in the middle of for example the urban urban uh, capital area and if if you don't have a car if you if you don't have money to to buy buy a bicycle or if you don't have uh, money to buy a, a tick, bus ticket so so do you really have an access how 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 if you don't know much about um, how to behave and, and um, how to, to reach reach the forest or or how to to do these activities then then um, it, 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 it won't be accessible for everybody then of course all these funding issues uh, service issues and in the end whose responsibility is it they would it be a would it would the nature be some kind of a pub, public good and and should everyone be somehow supported to have an access this this is a, somehow also a political question so um, these are pictures from my family album uh, how how we do enjoy the the nature so basically uh, no cost uh, enjoyment, uh, basically voluntary uh, activities um, uh, within the family, and and this is something I would think everyone would deserve to have an opportunity to enjoy the nature, nature for free. Thank you very much for your attention. This was my. Um, my presentation. Well, thank you very much, Professor Kompola. Uh, it was a great overview and also thank you very much for raising this important topics. I guess it is important not only in the context of tourism, but also 
uh, generally in context of the society and our development in the future. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and thank you also for the insights, uh, how it works also in Finland. Um, I guess it's no wonder why this topic was uh, raised in, in context based on this example of Finland. Um, and uh, I guess now we are looking forward to the questions. Um, to the questions uh, concerning your topic. So please feel free to ask the questions. Um, well, um, then, um, and meanwhile, I will ask my question. Um, I guess you have heard it uh, today many, many times already, and we have uh, we have discussed it a lot today. But still, I must ask uh, how uh, this Corona situation and uh, Corona um, factors uh, have influenced the development of this. Um, tourism sector in Finland? How do you see it? And which kind of opportunities are there um, in this regard? Um, all right. So um, I would say that, uh, like in, in most other countries, um, the, the domestic tourism has, has been booming. And particularly, the nature-based tour, uh, tourism has been booming. For example, uh, you can see my background. It's from the from the Koli National Park. So um, Koli, of course, is one of the, the most uh, popular national parks in Finland. But, but I would say that during this summer and last summer, uh, that was probably the first time during my lifetime when, when we could see people walking in queues, in lines, uh, in the forest. So, yeah. so I'm used to that from, from uh, Kusamo uh, in, in earlier times during the, 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 the autumn holiday week, one week and or one week, but um, not normally here in, in, in our region. But everywhere in, in Finland, in, in all the national parks, uh, this has been, uh, these two summers have been the, 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 the most uh, popular, uh, the most uh, successful in, in terms of, um, of uh, nature-based tourism. Um, uh, but, um, of course, um, we also have suffered the, the similar kind of side effects, meaning that um, as there have been um, somehow new segments to visit the nature, those, those who are not so experienced, then, then there have been the similar kind of, uh, similar kind of problems like, um, like uh, not bringing the waste back home, but, but leaving, leaving waste uh, in, in the national parks, also uh, making open fires, uh, during the time when it's really not uh, allowed or, or making fires uh, places where it's not allowed. Um, uh, and uh, and um, all, all these kind of uh, issues we have faced. Um, we uh, really hope that um, this uh, domestic uh, tourism and domestic um, boom uh, also has um, encouraged uh, new segments to, to, to enjoy the nature and, and also um, that uh, this, this will um, be in, uh, also in, in the future part of their lives. But, um, but uh, then also um, the, the sector that I was talking about here, uh, the social tourism that has that's, that has suffered, like also all the other other um, other sectors. Uh, uh, but um, well, so domestic tourism, nature-based tourism, have been very successful during these two summers. Is it is it now getting somehow back to normal, back to uh, at least a little bit um, similar to what you had before? Uh, well, Finland um, 
it's probably uh, one of those countries which which have um, dealt this COVID uh, situation um, quite well. Yeah. We, uh, we have had uh, quite strict uh, regulations and uh, now we are slowly uh, coming back to the normal, mm -hmm. new normal, I don't know, normal or new normal. And uh, there was... Uh, one week or two weeks ago, there was um, my my colleague, uh, Professor Juho Besoning, was was uh, interviewed in in the Finnish television and uh, uh, with uh, a uh, person from the travel agency, travel operator um, uh, business, and the, they both said that most probably the the travel uh, to to travel abroad. Is, is also now starting and um, package tours sell very well at the moment and next week is actually a autumn holiday week um, in most at least here in the eastern and northern part of Finland and I know that um, those uh, package tours to Canary Islands or Greece or wherever they were very quickly sold out so People, people start traveling abroad and um, I'm afraid that um, uh, even though the domestic travel uh, was uh, booming during the two summers now, probably those who travel, they will travel abroad as soon as it's possible, but, but hopefully still also domestic. Travel. Yeah, probably now people look forward to some changes, uh, something yeah. that they lacked so so long uh, the Corona time. But maybe it will in a in a while it will again again change. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, well, then from my side, I would like to say, uh, to say thank you very much again uh, to you for joining us, for, for your very important contribution, for your research, for sharing your research results. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Yeah. And then um, I would like to hand over to the next speaker. Um, Nikolaus Papas, again, sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly, <laughs> um, an associate professor in tourism, hospitality and events, uh, and also the director of the Center of Research in Tourism Excellence at the University of Sunderland, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, so the topic of his presentation is uh, tourism and nature tourism during the pandemic. Uh, so Professor Papas, you are welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, good uh, good afternoon from the rainy as usual United Kingdom. Uh, my name is Nicholas Papas, and I am going to deliver this uh, presentation concerning tourism, concerning nature tourism, and uh, the effects of uh, the pandemic. Uh, you know, uh, starters, uh, can you see my screen? I've shared my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Very okay, well. perfect. Thank you. Perfect. So let's continue. Uh, so as we know, uh, uh, COVID had a devastating impact, uh, a devastating impact in uh, tourism worldwide. Actually, tourism is considered as uh, the third largest uh, sector uh, in all over the uh, economic sector in all over the world uh, after petroleum and automotive. And uh, if we also include uh, the indirect earnings of tourism, it is by far the largest economic sector in the world. Uh, tourism is uh, the sector that has actually affected most than any other sector uh, in all over the world. Uh, more than 100 million uh, people uh, uh, have found themselves uh, of uh, having their jobs at risk. But the small businesses uh, were the most vulnerable ones, especially in uh, uh, the hospitality industry, whilst more than 90% of uh, uh, the enterprises in accommodation sector uh, are family-owned or uh, SME, small and medium enterprises, uh, as uh, 
where we also know from uh, the World Tourism Organization, more than 90% of museums uh, closed and uh, uh, 13, uh, now the, the, this estimation is about 20% uh, of uh, the museums may never reopen. Uh, no nation was unaffected uh, from COVID, uh, especially uh, the developing world and uh, the underdeveloped world uh, was hit uh, hardest uh, in terms of COVID and the loss uh, is about 1 trillion US dollars. Uh, as far as it concerns only uh, 2020 estimates, if we also include the estimates of 2021, uh, this exceeds uh, 2 trillion uh, US dollars as a loss because of COVID in uh, the wider tourism and hostile industry. As you can see here, during 2020, this is a report, uh, this is the 2021 report for uh, uh, from uh, the World Tourism Organization. The most affected area because of COVID was Asia and the Pacific and the less affected areas uh, were the continents of America and Europe. Uh, when we say less affected areas, it seems that uh, the Americans in Europe went well uh, during COVID in terms of tourism. They didn't. They've lost more than two thirds of, uh, of their tourism. Considering that Europe is uh, the heart of tourism worldwide, and especially in the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, the Mediterranean region hosts about a third of, um, of tourist arrivals uh, worldwide. Uh, we can understand that uh, we can understand the devastating effect of uh, uh, COVID uh, all around the world, and uh, especially in tourism and how tourism actually affects uh, other industries because several other industries uh, are operating uh, within the framework of uh, tourism. So as far as it concerns uh, tourists, uh, the COVID-19 effect in travel intentions uh, uh, meant that uh, tourists uh, were highly considered uh, the holiday risks and uh, also the impact of uh, the pandemic uh, in terms of their traveling, in terms of their accommodation, in terms of uh, the selection of the destination, and finally, in terms of uh, the disposable income they had uh, in order to invest on tourism and maybe tourism holidays. That's why we had those devastating effects that uh, neared uh, uh, three quarters of tourism, more specifically in 2020, we had uh, a tourism reduction of 72%. As far as it uh, concerns now accommodation selection, uh, the most uh, important aspect for tourists were the health and safety issues as expected. And because of uh, this, uh, we also had the price quality nexus, uh, the, the perception on, uh, what, uh, uh, on whatever we spend for tourism, it's also an aspect of quality. We expect to gain the most in terms of quality, in terms of uh, uh, the money, the monetary, uh, cost uh, tourism has for us. Uh, the wider risk aspects uh, have also affected uh, the tourist accommodation selection and for the first time in here we see that uh, quality is also related with health and safety. So while quality is related with health and safety we can understand that health and safety aspects during COVID are connected with all four facets as far as it concerns accommodation, the health and safety, the price quality nexus and the wider risk aspects. So as far as, uh, as it concerns the accommodation selection, why do I focus on accommodation selection? Because the accommodation sector, the hospitality sector is the largest subsector of tourism, uh, has been uh, heavily affected uh, during uh, COVID-19 and these are the regions that uh, have driven uh, the decisions of uh, holiday makers uh, all around the world. Apart from tourists, we also have the people working in tourism. So what we see, uh, what we've seen, uh, what we've experienced during uh, COVID-19 was the depression uh, of uh, people working in tourism. Uh, this was uh, predominantly based on the risk perceptions uh, concerning the pandemic and then the moderating factors of job satisfaction during the pandemic and also the involvement of each and every uh, person working in tourism and hospitality industry as far as it concerns the number of children and uh, the marital status and the family aspects uh, it had to involve. So job satisfaction and number of children were actually the most uh, important uh, uh, moderating factors in order to lead somebody working in the tourism and hospitality industry to depression during COVID-19. 
And obviously this has affected mental health and uh, the factors affecting mental health was the fear of the economic crisis, of uh, the reduction of uh, the income because of uh, closures into the tourism and hospitality industry. Uh, also meaning uh, the non-employability of uh, people working in uh, uh, the industry, uh, the direct or indirect uh, uh, enterprises related with tourism and hospitality, the perceived job insecurity and the fear of COVID-19 on uh, how COVID-19 uh, will actually progress. A fear that still exists because we are not yet out of the woods as far as it concerns COVID-19. So as far as it concerns now the expectation of uh, recovery in terms of COVID, as you can see here, uh, most uh, people believe uh, that uh, this recovery will be held from 2022 and uh, onwards. There is kind of an exception in Europe uh, that uh, uh, several people believe that uh, this uh, will happen uh, uh, during 2021. Now we know that this is not going to happen and uh, all our hopes now is that uh, we will start having a return to normality during 2022. As we can see here, the expectations now to return to pre-pandemic level uh, are from 2024 onwards. When we talk about those expectations, we talk about tourist flows expectations, not the financial expectations. Considering that COVID has also generated a worldwide uh, uh, recession, a worldwide economic crisis, the expectations in order to return to pre-pandemic levels in terms of revenues, in terms of profits, uh, means that uh, this goes three, four years later than it shows, uh, than this diagram shows. So we talk about 2027, 2028. But all these aspects deal with forecasts. In order to be more precise, uh, last year, uh, as we can see here, the World Tourism Organization predicted that after the sharp fall uh, the tourism uh, was going to have uh, during 2020, we are going to have uh, a sharp increase of tourism from 2021 onwards. In here, you can see three scenarios. The optimistic scenario is uh, with uh, the grey dotted line, uh, the more, uh, let's say, rational scenarios with uh, uh, the green line and uh, the pessimistic scenario, according to uh, w, uh, WTO in 2020, is uh, the one with uh, uh, the red dotted line. Finally, uh, life has proven that uh, the, all these three scenarios uh, are wishful thinking, because in 2021, uh, on May 2021, just less than a year than the first forecast, uh, the World Tourism Organization uh, has advised us that uh, uh, the recovery is not going to be sharp. We're not going to uh, have a, a sharp uh, comeback in tourism, uh, while actually uh, it has created also three scenarios, the optimistic, the more rational, and uh, the pessimistic scenario. The optimistic scenario was talking uh, about a minus 58% of uh, tourist arrivals uh, uh, during 2021, uh, uh, whilst uh, uh, the, the pessimistic scenario was talking about a minus 78% of arrivals of tourist flows of tourism during uh, 2021. This was on May 2021. This report of uh, WTO uh, was released on May 2021. Last week, WTO has released another scenario, whilst the, the Pessimistic scenario of the May 2021 scenario was actually the over-optimistic scenario uh, that has released just a week ago. So as far as it concerns the World Tourism Organization, in order to restart tourism, we need to uh, focus on some specific uh, priorities, five priorities. The first one is to mitigate the socioeconomic impacts on livelihoods, especially uh, during uh, this uh, global recession uh, that COVID-19 has actually created. We also need to boost the competitiveness and build resilience of companies, of destinations, and uh, also the tourist flows we have in several destinations across the world to advance innovation and digital transformation of tourism. So as you can understand, we need to build innovation. We need to build resilience with recovery 
in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19 effects and also focus on sustainability, focus on green growth. In here, we start talking about nature tourism. We need to coordinate partnerships and to restart and transform the tourism sector. So as far as it concerns nature tourism, it's a fact that during COVID-19, many nature areas have been uh, revitalized because of uh, the lack of visitation or uh, the minimal visitation uh, they had. So they had uh, small numbers of people visiting. So many nature areas uh, have actually uh, revitalized during COVID-19. However, the impact of COVID-19 in nature tourism were not all beneficial. In several locations, the program ha had to be cut as tourist revenue collapsed, resulting in increased level of poaching in several nature tourism areas and protected areas. The livelihoods have been erased due to a lack of visitors putting more pressure on natural resources. So people working there, people leaving from tourism, in order to continue living, they started uh, exploiting natural resources more and more. So actually protected areas and uh, natural prote uh, protected areas have faced other problems because of lack of tourism, even if several areas, as I've already said, uh, have been revitalized because of COVID-19. So we had a sharp increase of anthropogenic assaults to, uh, the, uh, to nature and uh, COVID-19 has also uh, risen uh, the destructive behavior uh, of uh, humans in uh, several protected areas and uh, several nature areas. So in here, we need to focus on the recovery strategies for uh, nature tourism to promote the role of prote uh, protection and uh, uh, conservation areas in sustaining human physical and uh, psychological health. And uh, also many uh, protected areas and many nature-based areas uh, had uh, more tourists uh, at the end of the pandemic than they had in the beginning of the pandemic. Several areas uh, in, like, uh, in Brazil, uh, like Ecuador, like Egypt, have reopened uh, and uh, started accepting uh, tourists uh, when the number of cases was low or when uh, specific uh, policies, tourism policies, have allowed those areas uh, to open. Uh, and also in-person uh, visitation programs, uh, in some cases, uh, were banned. Uh, and uh, also we've used, uh, heavily used social media in order to, uh, to promote uh, nature tourism. In here, I must, uh, uh, unfortunately, I must say that uh, uh, WDO uh, warns that uh, the main problem we are going to face in the, in the future is climate change. And climate change is not something that it is not connected with epidemics and pandemics. Because of climate change, World Health Organization warns us that uh, epidemics and pandemics in all over the world are going to sharply increase in the forthcoming years. So if uh, some people believe that uh, we're nearly out of uh, uh, the current pandemic, uh, maybe we are from the current pandemic, but we are not actually at the end of pandemics. Actually, we're in the beginning of all these aspects because of climate change. So actually, we need to think of what we're going to do in the future, how we are going to behave, because epidemics and pandemics and now uh, additionally climate change is going to be here. So nature tourism is a great opportunity for tourism in order to revitalize specific areas, in order to better promote sustainability and uh, to have a, a higher quality as far as it concerns uh, tourism uh, and uh, tourist products and services worldwide. So actually we have some innovative products uh, in terms of nature tourism and say uh, we can promote pro uh, product resilience uh, in COVID-19 and also in any other epidemics and pandemics that according to World Tur uh, Health Organization, they're going to come in the future. We have agricultural and fruit products. We have community support. This also embeds aspects of community participation, participatory democracy, how the decisions are taken in destinations and how the community is respected and the perspectives of community are respected in, our, uh, in order to take those decisions. How do we build competitive advantage? How do we handle our competitors? 
the craft products in specific destinations, also connected with nature tourism, the partnerships we build, the source market, and also the use of technology, the virtual tours, the virtual reality, extended reality, augmented reality, are actually innovative aspects that can further promote nature tourism that, and they can further create product resilience and service resilience and diversification, not only during COVID-19, but in general. Development now drivers for nature tourism. There are several uh, drivers like market forces and uh, tourist demand will heighten awareness of value and dependency of tourism and nature. Social distancing may continue uh, be present in the future, and we do not actually know how much people might want to uh, avoid social distancing in the future, or uh, social distancing may become a facet of our everyday life, even if there are no specific measures and regulations for social distancing. How travelers are going to uh, behave, especially in less developed and coastal uh, areas and destinations. The nature will play a fundamental role for tourism recovery and uh, the recovery of uh, the tourism industry. The low visitor numbers will also help uh, the reduction of impacts of uh, travel in specific destinations and also uh, help for uh, achieving higher levels of sustainability in destinations that actually uh, assists uh, the development, the further development of nature tourism. And again, we have natural values, nature values, with travelers, tourists seeking to avoid crowds and polluted, uh, and polluted uh, cities and uh, urban areas, something that actually COVID has assisted uh, as a driver in uh, nature tourism. So this was uh, presentations and these were uh, the references I've used. Uh, for building this presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention and for once more to say that we are not yet out of the woods and it's going to take several years before we get out of the woods of COVID-19 and any other epidemics and pandemics we're going to face in uh, the forthcoming years. Thank you for your attention. So, thank uh, you. Other Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Pappas. Um, this topic, I guess, will be, uh, uh, will remain important uh, in many, ma many years, two, three years at least. Uh, and we will, uh, we will research the influence of uh, the Corona situation on, not only on tourism, but on all the spheres of our um, life. Uh, so we are looking forward to the questions. Um, are there any questions in regard to this presentation? Uh, well, um, I would like to ask um, what is your personal forecast uh, in regard to customer behavior? So how, how do you think, how do you evaluate, how will customer behavior and tourist behavior will change uh, in two, three, five years, um, influencing by that situation? What do you think? Are there, uh, will, will there be some new trends in tourism behavior or some fears or something like this? For starters, it's value for money, the first mm -hmm. one. Uh, when we pay something uh, from the forthcoming years, uh, we are going as uh, consumers, uh, we are going to demand more and more, which means added value to products and services, uh, which means uh, better conditions, uh, more clarifications on where to go, what to do, how we're going to do it, what's going to offer uh, this uh, to us, uh, more flexible tourist packages, uh, more flexibility on whatever we do. Uh, also, uh, we become more and more aware uh, with aspects of uh, sustainability, uh, alternative uh, environmentally friendly forms of tourism are going to further develop. Uh, the people are going to be very, very cautious uh, on uh, their activities in uh, uh, all destinations, especially urban destinations. I focus on urban destinations because approximately 80% of tourism activity is held in urban destinations. Uh, this is uh, going to change, not rapidly, but uh, it's going to change. So uh, I expect us uh, to see uh, more rural tourism happening, 
uh, more focus on nature tourism, more focus on uh, sustainable forms of tourism, environmentally friendly, sustainable forms of tourism. And uh, all these aspects of pandemics and epidemics are going to be directly connected with climate change in uh, the forthcoming years. And uh, the more we progress on this and more environmental distractions we have, this awareness is going to uh, become more and more vivid. So mm -hmm. this is how I foresee the future. And uh, I don't think there is uh, any other way. And uh, considering the targets uh, set by uh, world leaders uh, for 2030 in Europe and uh, worldwide, and uh, what we're going to do as far as it concerns uh, emissions and as far as it concerns our con consumption behavior, this will definitely affect tourism since it's uh, uh, considered a, a luxury activity. And uh, since uh, uh, we have a perishable income that we invest on tourism. So all these aspects uh, are going to directly affect uh, tourism activity and nature tourism in the future. Uh, do you think it will also influence the distance somehow when uh, by the choice of the destination? So long distance trips will be not so popular as before, or do you think it will get back to normal in the future? It depends on the prices and mm -hmm. uh, especially on how we are going to handle the current recession because of COVID. We didn't get out of the previous recession and we've yeah. got ourselves into a new recession. And uh, this recession creates a vicious circle and we are in a recession uh, all over and all over. And uh, I talk about recession because uh, uh, when we talk about tourism, we talk about uh, the the ability of people traveling, but the ability of people predominantly living in developed countries, because these are the people that have the financial ability to do so. But the developed countries are the ones that have been mostly affected by COVID as far as it concerns uh, uh, revenues, as far as it concerns employability and so on. That's why I focus on those people. We say that tourism is for everybody, whilst this is just a myth, because only from the 7 billion people living in this planet, only 2 billion people have the ability to go for tourism. So yeah. actually, this affects uh, our consumption patterns and uh, this affects on uh, what we do. So long haul destinations depends on the prices, depends on the recession depends on uh, the competitive advantages that are going to be offered, the added value that is going to be offered, mm -hmm. and on what destination uh, we talk about. Because mm -hmm. a long-haul destination for Europe is a totally different long-haul destination for uh, the Australians. Yeah, that's So, true. for example, right now I'm in Sunderland. Going to Manchester, it's uh, next door. Going to Sydney is uh, at the other side of the world. But if I was living in Melbourne, going to Sydney was nothing, but coming in Manchester, it's just uh, uh, on the other side of the wall. So to whom we talk to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I meant, uh, would you uh, living in Sunderland prefer uh, to go to Manchester or to Sydney? Uh, that's what I meant. So uh, the, uh, the way of, of thinking and uh, perceiving perception of uh, the mm -hmm. travel as a whole. So, yeah. I that's... would prefer to go somewhere safe. Yeah, yeah, that's... That's the I can first thing that. I have in my mind. And yeah. then whether it's Manchester or Sydney. So it's if I am to spend a, a couple of weeks for vacations, I don't care if I spend five more hours uh, within the airplane yeah. to go somewhere, as long as it is safe wherever I go. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question from the chat. Do you have any idea when we can travel safely? So maybe a forecast... One, two, five, ten. Even years. even now we can travel safely, mm -hmm. depending on the way we operate. Even now we can be safe in a specific destination, depending on our behavior in this specific destination. Uh, if this entails the aspect that we do not need to be careful because uh, uh, we've overcame uh, COVID nineteen, uh, no, we didn't. That's mm -hmm. why now we have free, uh, the third job in many countries as far as it concerns vaccination. That's why we still have uh, many COVID cases and uh, many fatalities each and every day. Just to say that uh, right now, worldwide, we have more fatalities from COVID than we had last year, exactly the same period of time. Mm -hmm. Even if last year we didn't have any vaccinations. 
So we are not out of the woods. We are not over with COVID yet. Hopefully we will during 2022 onwards, from the beginning of 2022 onwards, at least in a significant extent. But we are not yet out. When we are going to travel safely? I don't know, because I don't know uh, if other, when, not if, when other pandemics and epidemics are going to come. As long as we have climate change as the main aspect that we need to confront, and as long as the World Health Organization uh, what is warning us from several years now, since 2015, about this, and since 2005 that we are going to have a, a pandemic, and finally we had a pandemic at the end of 2019, since it warns us uh, that as long as we have climate change, pandemics and epidemics are going to be more and more and more. I cannot give an answer on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Apologies for not being optimistic, but <laughs> realistic. This is how it goes, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, any other questions? Any further comments or thoughts? Um, yeah, then I would like to say thank you again for your presentation, for your important contribution, and for, for this in depth insight into this topic into the, this very very important and, and up-to-date topic actually so and for joining us of course thank you very much thank you for having me as a keynote speaker wishing you a nice day and continuation of your online support thank you thank you and um yeah and now i would like to give you a brief um um a brief idea of uh, what happens next. Uh, so now we are having a break till uh, 4 p.m. Uh, and then we will meet again after the break uh, for the last block of the presentations. Uh, the first presentation on the topic of nature-based tourism and well-being, impacts and future outlook. Uh, and the another presentation on the topic of introduction to the International Journal of Spa and Wellness, comments from the editor-in-chief. Uh, so uh, please stay with us, enjoy your break and come back to us soon. See you.